Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second day of our workshop uh, from slavery to colonization, land and labor. My name is uh, Jeremy Martins. I'm here at UWA. And before we start, I'd just uh, like to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people as the traditional owners of the UWA Crawley campus from where I'm speaking to you today. The Wajak Noongar remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs, and knowledge. So welcome uh, to our two uh, speakers for this session, uh, Tony Ballantyne and Lorenzo Verasini. Um, we will be going in order uh, of the program, which means that uh, uh, Tony will speak first, followed by Lorenzo. I um, ask you please to write your questions that you have for the uh, speakers in the chat. Please, uh, especially in the chat, it's hard to have two, so, so ignore the Q&A function and, and just keep it in the chat for now. Um, I'll just quickly um, also uh, introduce the speakers. They will speak one after the other and we'll uh, keep questions until the end. So both of our speakers today are very well known. I, I probably don't need to uh, introduce them. Tony Ballantyne, of course, has worked extensively on the development of colonial knowledge, changing understandings of language, religion, and race, and the uneven webs of exchange and connection that gave the modern British Empire shape. And Lorenzo Verasini teaches history and politics at Swinburne, Swinburne University of Technology. His research focuses on the comparative history of colonial systems, and he has written several books, including Israel and Settler Society and Settler Colonialism, a Theoretical Overview which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. So welcome, both of you. I will pass on straight away to Tony. I'm going to mute myself, and uh, Tony is going to share his screen and uh, look forward to catching up at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Tihei uh, Moriora. Himeinui ki te mana whenua o tēnei rohi, waitaha ka te mamoe kaitahu, tēnā mauna whakahi, ki ne wai i tiri nei, tēnā rangatira huhua, tēnei te mihi, tēnei te mihi. He mihi hoki ki te tangata whenua o tēra o te wajak tangata, i nga kaumatua, i nga rangatira, nga mihi nui ki a koutou. Uh, in a kaifaka hore or tine hui, Denise Rako um, Jane, Tina Kurua, uh, in a rangatira, um, e humahima, uh, tina kato, tina kato, tina tato katoa. So I just began with a very quick mehi um, and an acknowledgement both of the Mana Whenua, the indigenous people of the place I'm speaking from, uh, Kaitahu Whanui, and also of the Wajak Nyunga people. Uh, the traditional owners of the land that, that our host institution rests upon and acknowledgement also of the elders and leaders, both uh, past and present. Um, it's fantastic to be here. And uh, also thanks to you, Jeremy, for chairing the session. So what I'm going to do is discuss uh, some of the social and cultural dimensions of economic relations in the early Otago colony. Although conventional national history narratives talk about the colonization of New Zealand uh, as a unified process, and remembering that New Zealand's made up of a series of islands to Ike Maui, to Waikunamu, Rio uh, Kohu, the North Island, South Island, Cham Islands, and many other islands. Um, in fact, the nature of its geography means it was far from a single process. Colonization was a messier set of processes there was a mix of informal settlements together with formal systematic colonies um, ordered along Wakefieldian lines. And of course, these were Wellington and Maunganui, established in 1840, New Plymouth in 1841, Nelson in that same year, Otago 1848, and Canterbury uh, in 1850. And of course, and Rowan last night encouraged us to think about Auckland Islands as well. Um, and of course, then there was also the short lived uh, French colonial experiment at Akaloa on Banks Peninsula. For much of the 19th century, uh, these were essentially coastal enclaves with tenuous overland transportation and communication linkages dependent on foreign coastal shipping. Colonial New Zealand was an archipelago of unevenly connected littoral settlements. 
I'll just tell you a little bit more about the Otago um, colony to set the scene. The genesis of the colony lay in the aspirations of the Scottish parliamentarian George Rennie to create a settlement dedicated to Scottish colonists under the aegis of the New Zealand Company. Rennie's plan to establish a new Edinburgh in the Southern Hemisphere was modified under the influence of the Reverend Dr. Thomas Burns, the nephew of the great poet Robbie Burns, John McGlashan, and William Cargill, who fleshed out Rennie's vision, but turned it into a project for the Free Church in the wake of the great disruption in the Scottish Presbyterian Church in 1843, a massive um, schism that saw over 450 clergy and a significant minority of the laity abandoned the established church in the wake of heated arguments about the patronage, about patronage and the state's interference in church affairs, basically a split between evangelicals and moderates. So the colony was dependent upon uh, the purchasing of land and 400,000 acres were purchased from Kaitahu in July 1844. And if you look in the map there, um, that uh, block ran really from Otako, you see there in the middle of the East Coast, down to uh, Te Kauroro or Molyneux or Nugget Point. And within that purchase, about 150,000 acres were designated for immediate settlement. Small reserves were set aside on the Otago Peninsula, on the Taiori and at uh, Kauroro uh, for Kaitahu. And the remainder of the land was to serve initially as temporary pasturage for the colonists and to be developed um, at a later date. Plans for colonization were elaborated in Scotland by the Lay Association of the Free Church of Scotland, rather than the New Zealand Company, and this later became the Otago Association under the leadership of Captain William Cargill and uh, Burns. These men were drawn to Wakefieldian principles, but wanted to give uh, the colony a distinctive religious basis and moral character. Their aspiration was that Otago would be a purely free church colony with the city of Dunedin, the Edinburgh of the South at its heart. In keeping with Wakefield's principal point of faith, the price of land in the settlement was to be high at about two pounds per acre, with the 2,000 available properties uh, being quite small initially. Each property comprised of a town section of a quarter of an acre, a suburban lot of 10 acres, and a 50-acre rural lot. Um, during uh, 1846 and 1847, uh, the surveyor Thomas Kettle led survey parties uh, to translate um, models of colonization developed in, in the studies and offices of Edinburgh into a workable system, discovering actually that the broken hills, streams, wetlands, and estuaries of Otago were pretty challenging uh, to this neat theoretical scheme. In uh, March and April 1848, the first immigrants, some 248, arrived on board the John Wycliffe and upon the storeship, the Philip Lane. When the colonists arrived, they entered into a coastal region um, where there had been shifting and often intense cross-cultural contact over the previous two decades. Otago Harbour, uh, Te Awa Mona, Moana Otako, was itself very well connected, both through the pathways and networks of indigenous mobility that reached south down to Awarua and Fogo Strait into Raki Ura and north along the Araita Uru coast to key settlements like Waipuaiti, which we see a map of here, Moidaki, and then further north still to Akarola and beyond. Europeans have been active uh, along the south coast from the final years of the 18th century, although their entry into Otago Harbour really came a decade later than that. Still, seals were the initial primary attraction and parties supported by small schooners out of Port Jackson and Hobart worked the coasts. From the late 1820s, shore whaling stations were established, reaching from the first site at Preservation Inlet in Fiordland around the coast with at least a dozen, dozen others founded uh, between Upper Rim or Jacobs River and Moidaki. That activity was enabled by the ships and capital of New South Wales merchants, but the stations themselves were important sites of cross-cultural engagement. They were hybrid spaces where payment was made through the lay system, but market relations flourished with a focus on consumption. 
alcohol, tea and sugar were the key commodities. Mixed race families developed around these stations and the social order was the negotiated outcome of the interplay between tikanga Māori, uh, local ways and, and customs of doing things. Particularly important here was tapu and the distinctive work discipline of whaling. At the same time, Otago Harbour and uh, Rakiura's Patterson Inlet were base, bases for deep sea whaling ships registered in a range of nations. So why is this history important, this pre-Wakefieldian history of contact? Well, really for three reasons. First, Kaitahu were already familiar with Europeans prior to colonization. European technologies and ideas um, became very important in their cultural and economic life, not just through sailors and whalers who worked the coast, but through their own visits uh, of particularly influential uh, rakatera or, or chiefs to Poi Hakena, to Port Jackson. Second, these engagements propelled substantial demographic change. Um, the Rickless region in southern New Zealand, where it's a lot cooler, had only ever supported a much smaller population because key Polynesian crops were uh, unable to be cultivated on a reliable basis. So a complex system of regional, um, system of seasonal food workings called Mahika Kai was developed. Now that um, small base population was reduced by inter and intra kindred conflicts in the 1820s and 1830s, but it also felt the uh, effects of epidemic disease especially measles and influenza. Um, and there's quite strong evidence to suggest the children of those mixed race families avoided uh, the worst effects of these terrible outbreaks, meaning that those families were particularly influential as the colonial order was established. Now, disease and death not only weakened long-established forms of cultural transmission, but also weakened the base of the tribal economy. With declining labor inputs, it was difficult to produce flax and potatoes for market, and some traditional patterns of resource use were also set aside. The third reason um, this prehistory of, of contact pre-colonization is really significant um, is that environmental change and the depletion of the whale population meant that the shore whaling um, arrangements uh, were declining in profitability. And this meant from the late 1830s, just beginning then, but really from the early 1840s, um, some of these important maritime men from New South Wales began to transition to new activities. At Waikawaiti, uh, the wealthiest of these men, Johnny Jones, established a farm which progressed well, and he played a key role in supplying the early colonists with food. And he was also an influential figure in the development of Dunedin as a city, even uh, issuing his own bank notes. So really playing a central role in the economic development. Further south, John Howell, we see here, um, turned his attention inland, introducing sheep and pioneering the development of extensive pastoral stations. So these men of the sea reinvented themselves as men of the land, and they would play key roles in Otago's development in the 1850s. And their economic enterprises actually anticipated some of the key lines of economic development that the Otago Association colonists would later follow. Yet, those uh, Wakefieldian colonists were generally skeptical of that earlier generation, in part because they retained uh, some of the imprints of the norms of maritime life and the lifestyles of the old stations were, to, were seen to embody the barbarity that the Presbyterian worthies of Dunedin were displacing through their commitment to the gospel of relentless improvement. Um, and I think, again, that's an interesting uh, point that Rohan raised in his paper yesterday about how um, these new forms of economic arrangement were seen to be displacing and improving earlier forms of organisation. But their desire to push aside or ignore these earlier social formations um, really shouldn't be our guide. They were actually very important and the interplay between these formations is really key. So a general um, kind of point or rule of thumb we might draw out of this is we cannot uh, ignore what comes before uh, the history of um, systematic colonization, what predates Wakefieldian settlements, both in terms of indigenous history or the pattern of earlier 
imperial intrusions in cross-cultural engagement. The second broad point I would like to make uh, this evening is really to emphasize the fundamental disconnect between indigenous social economic organization and the models promulgated by the Otago Association. Environmental perception, models of how resources should be allocated and used, and the ways in which economic life were organized were pivotal in shaping cross-cultural perceptions. Divergent understandings of plenty and paucity were articulated in this counter, uh, encounter, and they did not simply reflect two radically different models of reading the land and water, but they were also, I think, at the heart of the production of cultural difference. I'd like to suggest that there was a kind of folk political economy that was concerned about the intersection between land, labor, and population. Actually, also water too. Water is very significant. And this, these were at the heart of a set of powerful arguments that justified the economic marginalization of Kaitahu and propelled the drive for improvement, a relentless quest that was at the heart of the colonial enterprise in southern New Zealand. The colonists who arrived in Otago carried with them ideas about the nature and value of different types of economic activity. In sermons, public lectures, editorials, and letters to the editor, it is possible to discern a broad tradition of thought that was preoccupied with the interconnections between labor and capital, between cultivation and property, uh, population and urbanization, colonization and improvement. Colonists occasionally made explicit reference to John Locke, to Adam Smith, or even to Wakefield himself. Of course, the works of all of these men were available and read in the colony. But this folk tradition of social argument tended to draw upon simple maxims or key phrases drawn from these authors, like Wakefield's sufficient price, which we see recurring again and again, or Locke's theory that it was labor that established property rights. But it was these kind of shorthand, compressed versions of arguments that we see rather than sustained engagements with the complexities of their work as a whole. Now, these ideas tended to be blended with biblical teaching, common understandings about the importance of agriculture and trade, and widely accepted ideas about improvement. The colonies, the colonies minister, Burns, was convinced that the industry of Presbyterian colonists would remake the land as they produced an order and ordered and stable colony. The region's noble plains would be covered with herds and flocks, and its valleys would be soon waving with yellow corn. Burns was not alone in imagining the colony as a kind of promised land for the Scottish Presbyterians. Indeed, some colonists called it our Otago Israel, or the Scotch Canaan. But in fact, improving Otago, making it plentiful, was a long and difficult process. Improvement was not random or haphazard. It required large investments of British, Australian, and local capital, extensive experimentation with seed stock and cropping systems, wide ranging exchanges of information and techniques, and a complex set of commercial practices. It also relied on the development of credit and insurance apparatuses and a dense mesh of financial relationships. And most of all, it was underwritten by the creation of a system of property through surveying a regulated land market and the authority of courts to seal disputes over land rights. And Jonathan West has done great work on these histories in a, in a very uh, defined area on the Otago Peninsula. Within the framework of this folk political economy, Kaitahu's continued investment in Mahika Kai, those seasonal food workings, um, suggested that they were an obstacle to improvement. Many Kaitahu uh, Whanui uh, families and, and groups continued to organize their economic activity through a seasonally defined and task-based pattern of labor. And Michael Stevens' outstanding work on mutton birding um, really is a great uh, source of insights into this. This was a model that of course diverged sharply from those that structured Scottish political economy and the reordering of production and labor in the Scottish lowlands where the widespread application of steam and water power and production flattened out seasonal variations in labor inputs. In light of this experience, many colonists would have sympathized with Adam Smith's argument that more, that more sophisticated forms of economic production required greater and more consistent work 
a discipline that was believed to be dif difficult for Kaitahi to explain, uh, sorry, to attain. And this was seen to have great explanatory power for the nature of cultural difference. So here, you know, I'm really emphasizing that economics were absolutely pivotal in the production of understandings of race and culture. Just to, to end, and I'll, I'll just deal with this really quickly, but it is a, a key point and taking some cues from my friend and colleague, Antoinette Burton's insistence that we place dissent and disruption at the center of our histories. Um, right from the outset and through the processes of colonization, it's really important to acknowledge that uh, Kaitahu uh, families and hapu and leaders uh, contested the, the patterns of colonial development and their outcomes. Um, Two minutes, Tony. Yep. So just to give you one example, here we have uh, the very influential uh, Tuhonga and chief Matiaha Tio Morohu, who wrote a very famous letter to Lieutenant Governor Eyre, where he talked about um, this being the starting of complaining to white people. Um, and Kaitahu leaders were consistent and eloquent in raising their grievances and making arguments about the insufficiency of the reserve set aside for them and the coercive nature of colonial agreements. It took a very, very long time for those arguments to be won, in fact, until the end of the 1990s. Um, but the point I want to make really and to end with is that um, right from the outset, uh, the uneven, the fundamentally uneven and inequitable nature of colonization um, was contested by uh, Mana Whenua. So that just leads us to a third rule of thumb, if you like. Empire was always subject to contestation. Um, and I think that's something that we're very aware of, but we mustn't lose sight of. And we can tend to, I think, if we get focused simply on textual readings of political economy. So just to end, these three rules of thumb, paying attention to what has come before, the idea that economics was central to the production of colonial difference, and empires and colonial rule were contested, shaped by descendant disruption, I think are really useful when grappling with these questions about land and labor and how we might think about the history of political economy and colonial spaces. So, uh, Kia ora thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tony, and I'll just uh, pass it on uh, directly to Lorenzo. A reminder, please put your questions in chat and we will uh, return to questions at the end of Lorenzo's talk. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, it's good to be here. And um, before I, I begin with my paper, I need to um, mention that um, my scholarship thrives on Jajaburung land, that um, this land belongs to them, and that um, I pay the rent because um, everybody knows that there's no sovereignty without a fiscal capability. Okay. So um, Wakefield was a significant, even if controversial, advocate of colonial reform. Some of the British colonies were eventually reformed as the imperial polity expanded in multiple theatres during the 19th century, even if his proposals were only partially adopted, even where they were adopted, and then they were largely discontinued. His ideas on political economy, labor, slavery, and what may replace it, however, were crucial beyond the British Empire. So my intervention today sort of further enlarges the, the, the scope of, um, of uh, the symposium so far. This paper traces the influence of Wakefield's idea in political economical debates in the United States during the Jacksonian era and in following decades. Wakefield was horrified by the American settlers and Americans typically re reciprocated. So this influence, while significant, was mainly mediated. And um, in the context of this mediation, I focus on, um, on Marx's um, work and especially on Capital's 33rd chapter. But Wakefield had America in his mind. A shock of the revolution was still burning. Lisa Ford's recent work has emphasized convincingly how the British Empire in the first decades of the 19th century was shaped fundamentally by reaction. 
Trade and free trade were important, humanitarian feelings too, but reactionary feelings were foundational. They shaped policy and sensitivities in ways that have been at times unduly underemphasized. Reaction here should be understood as anti-revolutionary, and shock is here used deliberately to emphasize the trauma-informed nature of Wakefield's contribution. Wakefield was indeed a reactionary. He saw revolution everywhere, at home and abroad. In America, he saw a war turned upside down. In the islands of the Caribbean, he saw revolution. And when he thought about slaves and former slaves no longer being compelled to work, he saw revolution. And when he looked at angry peasants in rural districts nearby, he saw revolution. In the agrarian insurgencies that shook the British Isles, he saw revolution. And in Australia, he saw another world turn upside down. Hence, his shock and Mr. Peel's shock at Swan River and Marx's this subsequent irony at their shock. So Wakefield traveled, his imagination traveled. He had been abroad as a young man and traveled to Canada twice, ending up in New Zealand at the end of his life. His ideas traveled too, in ways that go beyond the colonial undertakings of reformers and their official activities in nascent Antipodean colonies. They traveled to the United States when a local, where a local version of systematic colonization even uh, was on and off official federal policy, at least since the 1780s. So Marietta, Ohio was founded on systematic principle and the federalist principles, uh, even if the policy was not called systematic, and even if it was enacted way before Wakefield even articulated his ideas. Which is intriguing, because if Wakefield had known, and there is no way of knowing, he was somewhat of a plagiarizer as well as famously a kidnapper. But if he had not known, then there is something inherently transnational about his ideas about tampering with the market price of land. Then again, what would uh, become known as the American system, according to United States influential politician and statesman Henry Clay's famous definition, he was one of its most consistent and influential promoters, was also a plan for colonizing. The plan was made up of many components, including stiff tariffs and protectionism. More on these later. But one of them was that public lands should be sold at a relatively high price to generate federal revenue that would then be used to further an orderly expansion into new areas. What is significant is that Wakefield's proposal became prominent in the British Empire at a time when the Jacksonian Revolution was making them obsolete in the United States. Indeed, the Americans had Wakefield in their mind too. Wakefield spent decades remembering to forget the Americans, and they spent decades remembering to forget his ideas. I want to focus here on prominent economist Henry Carey, as Marx's engagement with Wakefield has already been the subject of a somewhat niche but attentive literature. Carey was close to a succession of precedents, a very influential essayist, and a widely read commentator. In my opinion, he was also a Wakefieldian. Karl Marx referred, Carey's, uh, referred to Carey's entire, entire bad joke, which was also a Wakefieldian joke. Um, the prospect that individual workers may earn enough and become independent proprietors. Carey believed that, still, that they still could and constructed an influential theory about the harmony of interests, whereas Wakefield had feared that in the settler colonies, workers wouldn't need to labor for a wage and endeavor to ensure that they did, hence his argument advocating a sufficient price for land. Carey's tariffs were very similar um, to, to Wakefield's sufficient price. Um, both economists broke away with free trade and with orthodox political economy, and both measures were designed to ensure that settlement would proceed gradually and that workers would be able to become settlers, but only after a period. Marx read both Wakefield and Carey, but concluded that workers could not become independent proprietors and that their social mobility would not last, hence the joke. A 2015 article dedicated to the relationship linking Wakefield and Marx, an article to which I contributed, followed Marx's rejoinder to Wakefield's interpretation of an episode in the early colonization of Western Australia, when servants had deserted wealthy and well-connected colonists. Wakefield's reaction to that episode was to develop the theory of systematic colonization, 
In turn, Mark's reading of Wakefield's project was instrumental in his development of the notion of primitive accumulation, the separation of workers from their means of subsistence, a process that forces them onto the wage relation and underpins the operation of capitalism. Carey did not like anything British, and Wakefield did not approve of anything American. Marx brought them into direct conversation because these political economists were talking about primitive accumulation, even if neither Carey nor Wakefield used the term. Wakefield endorsed primitive accumulation. He knew it was necessary for the operation of what he called capitalist civilization and wanted to reintroduce it where available. Free land in settler frontiers was undoing it. Importantly, as Jane has explained, and linking distinct colonial domains in a single field, he had begun his reflection on what compels laborers when considering the prospect of slavery's abolition. Carey also considered primitive accumulation necessary, but believed that its adverse consequences may be mitigated. Marx, on the contrary, believed that it was irreversible and that only a revolutionary passage would transform the world it had created and its mode of production. There was a coda to this debate. Two decades later, Henry George would powerfully rehearse Carey's argument in a different key. If for Carey, workers could become independent proprietors, for George, it was a matter of ensuring that they should again be able to do so. He had realized that they could not and argued that suggesting that they would, uh, that they could amounted to an idle taunt, I'm quoting. A taunt, after all, is a cruel joke. Georgism would become influential, especially in the United States and in the other settler colonial societies, including Australia and New Zealand. And yet, while George's land tax appear as a Wakefieldian solution, as it is about tampering with the price of land, it was meant to achieve a most un-Wakefieldian outcome, making land cheap again. These debates took place within larger 19th century contestations about growing contradictions, revolutionary possibilities or dangers, depending on how one looked at the prospect of revolution, and we know how Wakefield felt about revolution. Wakefield thought that contradictions could be effectively displaced elsewhere. Carey thought that laborers retained the option of displacing and that through displacement they could arise above their condition. Marx knew that contradictions would follow all escapes. Now, um, in my paper, I have a section on, um, on, on Marx and Wakefield. And, um, and, uh, and Marx was very crucial to the way Wakefield, Wakefield's, Wakefieldian ideas traveled. Um, but um, since I have only, um, 20 minutes. Um, I am going to skip largely this, this section and, and focus on, um, on, on, on another sort of nexus of, of, of travel for Wakefield's ideas. Um, I just want to rehearse this section quickly so that it makes more sense in the, in the context of the larger paper. Um, uh, Marx acknowledges that his ideas um, derive from Wakefield. Um, and uh, and that uh, his um, reading of um, the settler colonial relation uh, depends on Wakefield's reading. Um, and um, and um, Marx sort of recognizes what Wakefield had recognized that um, um, the settler colony at first is um, is outside of capitalist relations. Um, in in a famous uh, sort of a phrase um, that is often quoted, uh, Marx noted that uh, the, the, the laborer vanishes from the labor market in the settler colony, but not in the workhouse. Um, and, and Wakefield had similarly identified um, the laborer's disappearance and had offered a corrective. And so, um, um, Wakefield's ideas uh, were, were sort of codified and became even government policy. Um, so uh, Wakefield um, thought that the escape um, 
from contradiction could be permanent, that um, by way of an escape, revolution could be kept at bay. Um, and so that's where Wakefield and Marx sort of diverged because Marx concluded that um, the escape was only a temporary fix and that uh, contradictions as well as um, ideas would, would, would travel and catch up. So um, in this, in the third section of my paper, um, I follow um, uh, Henry Carey's um, ideas about um, um, sort of political economy and how they were actually a rehearsal of uh, Wakefieldian principles. Um, but um, we know that Carey had read Wakefield, um, but he doesn't cite him and um, neither Wakefield cites Carey. So I'm um, tracing the, the these ideas in, in, in their transition from different colonial locales um, by way of Marx. So Marx was a correspondent for the New York Tribune, uh, a platform that also hosted Carey. Carey was especially influential with and through the Tribune and had privileged access to its editor, Horace Greeley, Horace Greeley, and to many of the Whigs that would join the Republican Party. Greeley would famously proclaim the Go West Young Man doctrine. Marx's work for the Tribune uh, enabled him to follow closely Carey's political economy and the debates that would lead to the consolidation of the Republican Party. Carey's opinion mattered. He could shape editorial policy at the Tribune, which was the largest magazine in the United States at the time, possibly, and would be influential with the Lincoln administration. And he was successful in ensuring that tariffs were included in the Republican Party platform in 1860. Carey could also influence Charles Dana, who edited the Tribune after Greeley and employed Marx. Carey argued that economic development and the productivity upturns that followed the mechanization of industry would lead to an ever-increasing harmony of interests between workers and owners. Carey was thus a work failure. Um, um, he was an, an influential and consistent advocate of internal improvement, the American system, and tariffs. Um, these measures would ensure, he averred, that the industrialization of the East would be compatible with the orderly colonization of the West. At the time, the West was not the West, West, but was the, you know, the, the Midwest. Both Wakefield's sufficient price for land and Carey's tariffs fundamentally disrupted the free trade orthodoxies of the political economists. Now, I want to emphasize that uh, Wakefield and Carey and Marx were really outliers in the context of you know, debates about political economy. Um, no one sort of escaped the orthodoxies um, at the time. So Carey's style of support for protection was part of his embrace of what I have defined in my work, the politics of displacement. Tariff protection, in his view, was needed to displace manufacture itself from one location to another, and the harmony of interest would then be sustained by a displacement of people and manufacturers and by increased productivity, doing away with long-distance colonial free trade and associated transportation costs. So... Kerry was opposed to free trade. Um, he resented the unequal colonial relations that underpinned it and the British hegemony that sustained it. Um, um, and um, he realized that if commodities moved, people would not, not to the new lands as settler cultivators and not to the new lands as manufacturers. On the other hand, Kerry supported the displacement of people. I'm quoting from him. We need population, he concluded, arguing for that protection. Raising the value of labor promotes the annexation of individuals to the United States. So he didn't want to annex land, he wanted to annex individual. Um, and added that the movement of free settlers would mark, and I'm quoting again, the establishment of perfect tra free trade between ourselves and the people of Europe by inducing them to transfer themselves to our shores. It is a bounty on the importation of the machine we need, man, to give value to the machine we have in such abundance, land. Perfect free trade was counterposed to the false free trade support, supported by the British political economists. Most importantly, Kerry argued 
why annex land when you can annex people instead? Promote their displacement and welcome them to land the United States already owned. So if Wakefield aimed to annex enormous agrarian hinterlands to the British Isles, who could then grow demographically, Kerry argued that the United States should grow demographically through immigration to its enormous hinterland. Again, as I see a striking convergence and, and, and a very Wakefieldian argument. Crucially, the harmony of interests, the cornerstone of Carey's argument, like Wakefield's capitalist civilization, was only possible if workers could eventually become owners of farms. The harmony was premised on the ongoing availability of free or relatively cheap lands and on many laborers' willingness to displace there and on the sale of public lands in the United States, which, I'm quoting from Carey, alone would suffice to pay the expenses of government. So if primitive accumulation- Two minutes, Lorenzo. Fair enough. Um, let me get, um, to, yeah, this is, um, this is really quite timely. So if primitive accumulation is discovered in the settler colony by Wayfield, the Marxian theory of surplus value was a response to the notion of a putative harmony of interests. The latter required that Marx reflect on America as a specific social formation. It was a country, and I'm quoting from Marx, where bourgeois society did not develop on the foundation of the feudal system, but developed rather from itself, where the society appears not as the surviving result of a centuries old movement, but rather as the starting point of a new movement, where the state, in contrast to all earlier national formations, was from the beginning subordinate to bourgeois society, to its production, and never could make the pretense of to being an end in itself. And where finally, even the antithesis of bourgeois society itself appear as vanishing moments. So the antithesis were frontier circumstances characterized by a subsistence economy. It was a no not a normal situation, Marx pointed out. Whereas on the contrary for Carey, the political economy of settlement, what Wakefield had called the art of colonization, where everything except land is created out of nothing. This is a famous Wakefield phrase, you know, um, where everything except land is created out of nothing. Um, um, for Carey, the political economy of settlement was the natural economy or the eternal normal relations of social production. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting. Carey and Wakefield thought that settler colonialism properly guided his humanity in its natural state. On the contrary, Marx highlighted how profoundly ideological this perspective was. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo and uh, Tony. Uh, now, I would uh, invite uh, questions. I've got some already lined up, so I'll start with those. Um, in the chat, if you've got more, please add uh, uh, questions and I will read those out. So the first one I can see is for Tony. Thank you for such an informative discussion about Otago. What do you see as the connection between slavery and Otago colonization? <clears throat> well, I think that relationship is pretty highly mediated. Um, but slavery is a very important rhetorical figure in the, in the colony colonies early culture, particularly around arguments around economic relationships, the organization of labor, and um, and also broadly about cultural values. So very early, in fact, on board the, the ships carrying the first colonists, there are quite fierce contestations about what the length of the working day would be, whether it would be eight hours or 10 hours. And those who are arguing that um, eight hours would be the appropriate uh, working day, and they actually prevail on the ground in the colony very quickly. Um, they use the th uh, slavery as a rhetorical figure, and that the idea that they will be enslaved in the new world by being made to a to work a ten hour day, which is of course what the, many of them were working um, in the United Kingdom, and that was one of the motivations for them. Um, you know, migrating was to to change those economic relationships. So we see it as a recurrent figure. We see it particularly in the very important poetry of John Barr. Barr is a, a great Scottish versifier in the tradition of Burns, who produces poems in both English and the Scot and Scots um, in Otago. 
and we see slavery as a recurrent concern for him. And for him, um, I think, you know, his work kind of laces together what we might think of as a Presbyterian democratic intellect and a more generalised emphasis on liberty as the defining feature of Britishness. So slavery becomes, in his world, a marker of anything that impinges poten potentially on liberty. So, you know, the ghost of slavery is keenly felt, but the, re the direct relationship is, is, I think, not so strong. The, the, the um, earlier form, if you like, of labour organisation that the colonists are really keen to undermine and differentiate themselves from is that culture of the maritime world, of the sailors, but especially the shore whalers. And of course, the remnants of that um, tradition are laced into the community and very prominent. And some of those mixed race communities continue to adopt systems of economic organization, particularly seasonal work patterns that are seen to be at odds with that improving spirit. So those are some thoughts. Thank you, Tony. There's another question for you from Jane. Um, question for Tony. Um, struck by the centrality of property as a system in Otago as a key characteristic of the folk political economy, this seems a key innovation of Wakefield's scheme pursued enthusiastically by I, his followers. I, so. and if I could just speak to that because, um, and also add a little bit to it. So what I'm thinking is that um, a key aspect of, of Wakefield's system is, of course, the commoditization of land, mm. a, a very long-term process that, you know, Scholars suggest reached its its kind of climax with the Torrens title scheme in the 1850s. You know, this is a Wakefieldian thing. So I'm just wondering, would, given your fantastic sort of genealogy of these different formations in Otago, Tony, would you see this commoditization of land as a sort of key marker of this new folk political economy? But then also listening to Lorenzo's paper, I, I just wondered. Um, you know, this is obviously designed to ensure a labour supply. So were Māori, you know, who, who was sort of, I'm not sure whether you mentioned this, but mm. who did supply that labour force and were Māori included in that regime? Yep, so great, great question. So um, if we're thinking about commoditization of land, it, it, it certainly is a key marker of, of, of the Wakefield colony, but there are actually earlier moments of it that predate the arrival of the colonists. And the number of the, the Rakatila, the chiefs, enter into land agreements, sale agreements with Sydney merchants, um, really to access capital in order to buy muskets in the 1830s. And that's a response to the raids into the South Island by Ngati Toa from Kapiti Island, led by Te Dr. Hutt. Um, and so there's a very short term political, a very real pressure um, um, that that drives that. But certainly, you know, on a sustained basis, it is absolutely a marker of, of you know, the formal colonisation on, on Wakefieldian lines. But I would say that, you know, if, if we look at how people understand Wakefield, you know, they don't have a very, well, at least in their public articulations, they, they don't have a very uh, rich or nuanced understanding of Wakefield's theory at all. I mean, what you'll generally have is sufficient price as the phrase, or, you know, some of the variations that Lorenzo used in his paper, you know, where it's controlling the land market or regulating the land market are the kind of phrases that, that we tend to get. And of course, I think even in Wakefield's writings, you don't necessarily get a fully sketched out theory of property on the basis of that, it's that everything kind of cascades out of it. So in terms of how the colony worked on the ground, of course, that Wakefieldian understanding intersected with the structures already put in place by a colonial state on the ground in New Zealand, through a court system, through um, the availability of surveyors and you know the imposition of a kind of um, cadastral framework. Um, so those two things get get laced together. But you're absolutely right. I think it's at the cutting edge of colonization and, and the logic that underpins it in some ways is a very powerful inversion of indigenous logics. And we see this most markedly with regards to 
perhaps one of the most essential set of resources for Kaitahu, which is ocean fish. Now, fishing grounds were very carefully apportioned um, amongst Kaitahu. The rights were very strongly controlled and they were um, individualized to, you know, individuals or families were given access to particular fishing areas. Colonists say, no, well, you know, you can't mix your labor with the ocean. So the ocean is a commons, it's, you, you can't own fish. So, you know, I'm making a Lockean argument that basically inverts indigenous understandings. So, you know, I think one of the key things to appreciate in the Kaitahu world is that colonization, it actually has a much deeper and wider economic base than we often think about. It's not just land, it's all these other resources. Ocean fish are really key, and then labor is important too, Jane, but maybe Lorenzo has something to add. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, um, settlers expand by way of enforcing a common of an indigenous property. Mm -hmm. um, when we when we was well, we assumed that settlers would travel with their property, and they do, but um, there is a there is a commons that travels with them as well. Um, this is Alan Greer's sort of argument regarding the colonization of North America. So I'm, I'm, I'm reporting here. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Lorenzo. I've actually got, so there have been some comments, but I'm just uh, going for uh, clear, clear questions. So Zoe, uh, great papers, both thinking further about the way in which Otago colonists understood Wakefield shorthand maxims. I wondered if Lorenzo could comment on Wakefield's reception in the US more broadly beyond those closely engaged in political economy like Kerry? Um, sure, um, provided that we, 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 we know, but we understand that um, we are not gonna find explicit references to Wakefield. Um, um, there, was a, there was a disconnect in, in, uh, in sort of the, the copyright of ideas, but the ideas did travel. Indeed, um, are, you know, instances of what is, by all means and purposes, systematic colonization dot the, the American Midwest, especially Ohio. Um, the, the contestations between um, um, federalists and anti-federalists in the very early Republic um, are also uh, contestations about the need for systematic colonizations as argued by the federalists and the need to let settlers do whatever they want as argued by the anti-federalists. Um, uh, Wakefields himself may have benefited from, from these debates, even though he did not uh, refer to them in his, in his, uh, um, in his, uh, in his work. And that's why um, to, 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 to follow Wakefield's ideas, I needed to, to, to rely on Marx as a link between, uh, between Wakefield and, uh, and debates about political economy in the US. But um, um, the, the, the need for systematic colonization was argued for decades before Wakefield published and way after Wakefield published. So, um, um, you know, the, the, the ideas were present in the US and vice versa, you know, um, Wakefield benefited from, from, from articulations of the American system as a, as a mode of colonizing. So it went both ways, I think. Can I just jump in there, Lorenzo, and just uh, ask, do you, do you see any um, kind of uh, uh, cross fertilization of ideas with Canada, given uh, Canada's unique position, both adjacent uh, to the United States, but also part of uh, the British Empire, and so therefore much more um, connected with those kinds of Wakefieldian ideas? Yes, of course. Um, and, and let's not forget that you know, when we want to trace Wakefield's ideas, we we sort of um, have to know that uh, he also the Durham report, but couldn't be mentioned in it. There was that that component as well. So when we do um, when when we sort of trace the the, the way ideas travels transnationally, and um, uh, we 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 have to consider that 
Wakefield's name was was in many ways unutterable, and certainly so in uh, in Canada, um, uh, in what would become Canada. But the but um, but the point is that Wakefield's argument is that Canada was too close to the United States, which was um, um, moving towards very uh, um, you know to to recognizing squatters' rights, which was. Uh, Precisely what Wakefield was um, was uh, was uh, was 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 beating against, was was against um, was horrified by, and so the idea the idea was that um, Wakefield gave up on Canada because it was too close to the United States and focused on on Australasia instead um, because uh, there's no point in 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 insisting on a sufficient price for land if uh, your next door neighbor. Um, 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 is giving land free away, and or or or, or is likely to, um, and um, and and you can't do anything about it because you didn't win the war. So we've still got a time, five minutes or so. Does anyone else uh, want to uh, pose questions? Um, the chat is open. Um, Lorenzo and Tony, do you have any questions for each other? Yes, but <laughs> it will <laughs> I will it will require a proper session. You can now because we do have five minutes to go. So no one else is po posting questions. So if you did have anything you wanted to say. So I, I have a question from Lorenzo. And it's really following on from that that question about the identification of Wakefield with his ideas. And you know, I think about Antoinette Burton and Isabel Hoffmeyer's argument about print culture in this period. Um, and you know, they make an argument with an imperial framework about print culture as an imperial commons, but note that of course that spills out beyond the limits of the British Empire, where you know the the very loose control of of intellectual property and and copyright non-existent really in in in, in journals and newspapers means that there is this culture of scissors and paste journalism and the endless recycling of clippings and and um opinion pieces and and praises and i just wonder about the challenges for that is for historians because traditionally an intellectual issue of the history of ideas you know the author is important their identity is important their name is important so i just wonder methodologically lorenzo how do you draw the line at what is a Wakefieldian idea and what isn't, you know, what methodologically, how do we work in that space? Well, I was lucky that I could rely on Marx. Marx refers to both, engages with both and brings the idea of one in conversation with the ideas of the other. So in that respect, um, Marx um, um, is, is ahead of its time because it does recognize um, and cites. Um, and I should say, not really Marx, it's actually Engels that um, that sort of kept Marx honest in this respect. So, um, but, but, um, but I, I propose that provisionally, we could distinguish between um, what's a, a, a Wakefieldian idea in explicit terms and a Wakefieldian idea in, in deeds, right? So, the 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 American system and systematic colonization overlap in terms of policy, uh, and overlap um, in 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 ways that are so consistent that um, I wonder whether there is an, an actual translation between different colonial um, um, domains, right? But we cannot trace this 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 transition unless we do some serious philological work. Um, that, um, that, um, that 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 may be done, but um, um, hasn't been done in terms of uh, tracing the ways in which specific terms transfer from one place or another. But um, but 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 um, but you know, ideas about a system of colonizing, um, a bringing in towards networks of international trade. Uh, uh, um, the, the various settlers who are escaping 
um, um, you know, colonial networks. Uh, um, this, you know, this Whitefieldian indeed is, is, is Whitefieldianism indeed is something that uh, we can trace. Um, and uh, the American systems and decades of debate in America, uh, in the United States, about um, land, the price of land gradation and um, squatters' right and so on and so forth, um, um, sort of draw on Wakefieldian articulations. And in turn, well, and previously they had informed Wakefieldian articulations as well. So uh, Wakefield was part of this debate, if not in person, Certainly, his ideas were. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. We have just got to the hour. Um, we have half an hour break now, I believe. Let me double check. Yes. Oh, no, 15 minutes. Sorry, 15 minutes, not half an hour today. So 15 minutes. We will uh, take a quick break, go get something to drink or eat. And um, I look forward to seeing you uh, in 15 minutes. Thank you very much, everyone. We actually have one more minute, but um, I'm all ready. So I'll just wait for the, um, the actual time. <clears throat> Okay, so welcome to this afternoon session of From, uh, from Slavery to Colonisation, Land and Labour. Uh, my name is Jane Lydon and I'm chairing this afternoon's session um, uh, from the University of Western Australia. So again, before we begin, I'd like to pay my respects to the Wajak Noongar people of southwestern Western Australia and pay my respects to their elders past and present. It's my uh, great privilege to, uh, to chair this session uh, and two papers delivered by two colleagues of mine um, who I'm collaborating on as chief investigators in our Western Australian Legacies of British Slavery project. Uh, the way this initial session will work before our concluding roundtable uh, is that we'll be hearing from two speakers, uh, Zoe Laidlaw and Jeremy Martins, who will speak, who will give their papers one after another. So I'll introduce Zoe, she'll give her paper. I'll introduce Jeremy, he'll give his paper. And then we should have um, some time for 20 minutes for questions at the end of that time. Uh, so with no further ado, I'll introduce Zoe Laidlaw. Uh, professor Laidlaw, um, Zoe has been a professor of history at the University of Melbourne since 2018. Before that, she worked at the Royal Holloway University of London and then before that at the University of Sheffield. Uh, her expertise lies in the 19th century history of the British Empire, and her work covers <clears throat> imperial networks and governance, humanitarianism, settler colonialism and indigenous, indigenous settler relations, slavery, both its abolition and its legacies, the imperial state, commissions of inquiry, and the creation of imperial knowledge. Uh, she has also authored uh, several notable works. Uh, <clears throat> most recently, uh, her, her book, Protecting the Empire's Humanity, Thomas Hodgkin and British Colonial Activism between 1830 and 1870, was published last year. Before that, uh, many of you will know Colonial Connections, uh, Patronage, the Information Revolution and Colonial Government, published in 2005, and co-edited with Alan Lester, Indigenous Communities and Settler Colonialism landholding, loss and survival in an interconnected world. Uh, so with no further ado, I will hand over now to Zoe and her paper, Capital Agents and Absentees, Legacies of British Slavery in the Port Phillip District. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Jane. Can you see the slides? Is that all looking okay? That's looking great. 
Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm speaking this evening from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I'd like to acknowledge also the Aboriginal peoples of Western Victoria, particularly the Wadawurrung, Jaburung and Jagud Wurrung, the history of whose dispossession from country uh, informs largely this paper. So the paper I'm going to speak to today is concerned with connections between the Atlantic business of slavery and the pastoral economy that colonisers established in the Port Phillip district from the mid 1830s. Many individual Port Phillip colonisers had personal connections to Atlantic slavery as historians have increasingly recognised. Uh, some of these can be found in the UCL Legacies of British Slave Ownership database. Uh, Georgina Arnott and I have located more over the last couple of years on this project. And my current collaboration with Melbourne University's digital studio and two wonderful interns, Gigi Tang and Kanan Lan, is throwing up uh, even more leads. Most of the early Port Phillip district colonizers who arrived intending to become pastoralists brought with them capital of between about 1,500 and 2,000 pounds. But my concern today isn't with that group but with the smaller number of larger pastoral operations backed by British-based investors. So those who had an initial outlay of over 5,000 pounds. So for example, in 1839, the three British-based partners in Neil Black & Co used capital of nearly 10,000 pounds to establish a pastoral business at Glen Ormiston, 130 kilometers to the west of Geelong. Their land holdings would eventually extend over 70,000 acres. And pastoral partnerships like Neil Black & Co have been much studied in Victoria's history and used to demonstrate the strength of links between the colony and particular British regions. In what hasn't received much attention to date is where absentee investors had made their money in the first place. So because time is short, I'm going to focus today on just one large pastoral company, the Clyde Company, which was founded as a Scottish co-partnership in 1836. Its Port Phillip base was at Gulf Hill on Wadawurrung land, 40 kilometers to the west of Geelong. The Clyde Company's initial capital, raised entirely in Scotland, totaled 8,400 pounds, but its operations would ultimately extend over about 230,000 acres of Victoria, and most famously, it produced a lot of very fine wool. So while not representative of Port Phillip pastoralism, big ventures like the Clyde Company and Neil Black & Co certainly shaped um, the pastoral sector and Victoria's colonial society. And before I expand on the Clyde Company, I want to say a little bit more about the Port Phillip district's history, um, founded really in 1835-36 and becomes the colony of Victoria in 1851. Unlike the other Antipodean colonies that were started in the same era, it wasn't an experiment in Wakefieldian systematic colonization, or at least not formally. Instead, an unauthorized and ad hoc settler invasion of the Port Phillip district began in the mid 1830s, particularly motivated by tightening land availability and falling profits in Van Diemen's land. Like Wakefield, however, these colonizers sought both cheap land and abundant labor. However, in this instance, the British government didn't empower a colonization company to sell land or to conduct emigration on its behalf. And indeed, the government condemned the initial colonial occupation. Now, that history of how imperial authorities then scrambled to restrain this settler invasion is well known. And it includes the British government's dismissal of John Batman's private treaty with the Kulin Nation, the Henty brothers' um, incursion into the Port Phillip district through Portland Bay, the arrival of the overlanders who traveled south from Sydney with their flocks and herds, and as Janet McCalman's recently explored in her book, Vandemonians, migration across Bass Strait from Tasmania. Equally well known, I think, is the rapid invasion of the lands to the west of Port Phillip Bay, which accelerated particularly from late 1836. To assert some semblance of control, the colonial government in Sydney appointed a police magistrate for the new district, introduced a system of 10 pound annual pastoral leases and created an Aboriginal protectorate. That protectorate didn't prevent violent conflict between the colonizers and the Aboriginal peoples of Victoria. 
in less than two decades, the combined effects of violence, disease and alienation reduced the Indigenous population by about 80%. Aboriginal survivors and their descendants then faced continuing waves of dispossession, discrimination and family separation, while also becoming participants in the colonial economy. Colonisers seized much of what was called the Western District, especially quickly. By late 1836, sheep runs were extending 40 kilometres into Wadawurrung country from Geelong. Through 1837, squatters moved southwest towards Colac and west and northwest to the headwaters of the Lee and Bunanyong rivers. Colonisers tended not to acknowledge their violence against Aboriginal people, but the man manager of the Clyde Company recorded publicly that his employees killed at least two Wadawurrung men late in 1837 and violently broke up a Wadawurrung camp in mid-1839. In Jabwurrung country, into which the Clyde Company expanded, squatters occupied over 40% of the land by late 1840. And despite intense resistance, entailing more than 100 violent Jabwurrung deaths, this occupation rose, rate rose to 96%. Um, so squatters occupied 96% of the land by early 1846. Now, alluding to the speed of this invasion and occupation might suggest that as well as having very little concern for those who they dispossessed, the colonizers and their financial backers knew how lucrative the Port Phillip district's pastoral industries would become. With hindsight, it is clear that the largest pastoral fortunes were disproportionately accrued by those who had arrived early. But this wasn't obvious until much later, and initially money and labor were in short supply. The district's wool fetched disappointing prices, and the early 1840s financial crisis sent many to the wall. So among the questions that I'm addressing is which Britons invested in the early Port Phillip district and why did they do it? And to answer this, or at least to um, start sketching an answer, I'm going to explore uh, the Clyde Company and I'll turn first to its original partners. Then I'm going to talk a little bit more briefly about the Glasgow mercantile firm J&A Deniston, which became heavily involved in the Clyde Company and operated as a vector for imperial investment. As I mentioned, the Clyde Company's operations were based on Wadawurrung lands um, and its home station, Gulf Hill, lies about 40 kilometres to the west of Geelong near Shelford. Its initial capital of £8,400 was raised in Scotland in 1836 from seven equal shares, each comprising £1,200. The company's partners then invested a further £6,640 in 1841. I'm not going to talk really about labour in this paper, but the company recruited workers directly from Scotland, sought bounties under colonial immigration schemes, and also employed and underpaid Aboriginal labourers. Over time, the company acquired more properties in the Western District. Uh, the Clyde Company is um, highlighted there in blue. Um, and together these extended over about 230,000 acres. When it dissolved its operations in 1858, the company's assets were valued at more than a quarter of a million pounds. The Clyde Company's history is well known to historians of Victoria, largely because Philip Brown edited eight, record, eight volumes of its records uh, over several decades in the mid 20th century. Subsequent histories of Victoria's Western district and pastoralism including Margaret Kittle's 1961 Med of Yesterday, draw heavily on the Clyde Company's history and also on that of Neil Black & Co, which I mentioned earlier. Both Brown and Kittle recorded the names of the British-based investors in these pastoral companies. Um, all of the investors in the Clyde Company were Scottish, as were two of the three partners in Neil Black & Co. Historians of Victoria, including recently Benjamin Wilkie, argue that these kinds of partnerships demonstrate the strong links between the colonization of the Port Phillip district in Scotland through migration, personal networks and investment. I agree with this, but I'm also interested in how those offshore partners acquired their wealth. Historians of Victoria haven't really focused on this. Um, the Clyde Company's partners were all merchant traders with an Atlantic focus. Those in Neil Black and Co combined Atlantic and East India trade. Some of them had plantations in the Caribbean, others became heavily involved in Scotland's banking sector, which of course also developed not least to finance Atlantic trade. 
The partners in the um, Clyde Company were entangled with what um, Stephen Mullen's very recent book describes as the Glasgow sugar aristocracy. And this is a group that's also achieved, re received attention from Anthony Cook. Mullen treats these merchant capitalists as distinct from their 18th century tobacco lord forebears, but as equally imperially minded. These are wealthy Atlantic traders strongly opposed to emancipation. However, just as historians of Victoria haven't really looked beyond Scotland when accounting for these investors' wealth, Mullen's concern is with how this group changed the economies of the British Caribbean and Scotland, and he doesn't consider their impact in Australia. So who was involved in the early Clyde Company? The Clyde Company's manager in the Port Phillip district was this man, George Russell. Russell left Scotland for Van Diemen's Land in 1831 and then moved to the Port Phillip district in late 1836. He was initially paid a salary, but acquired an eighth and equal share in the Clyde Company after five years service. He also invested from 1836 independently in the Port Phillip district himself. When the Clyde Company dissolved in 1858, Russell was able to buy Gulf Hill from the, Clyde, from the company and he also, by that stage, owned a string of other Victorian pastoral properties, and he died a very rich man in 1888. All of the company's other original investors were brought into the co-partnership by another Scot, Captain Patrick Wood. After a career in the East India Company's Madras Army, Wood settled in Van Diemen's Land in 1821. His father was a merchant in Fife, his paternal grandfather and great-grandfather had both traded to the West Indies, and he had a paternal uncle who had settled in St Kitts. But it wasn't inherited wealth that established Wood as a Tasmanian pastoralist, but the backing of Glasgow's Deniston family. The Deniston's financial support helped Wood set up in the Clyde Valley to the northwest of Hobart, and there from 1831, he employed George Russell. In 1836, while he was visiting Scotland, Patrick Wood persuaded a group of friends, family and business associates to invest in the Port Phillip district via the Clyde Company. Wood returned to Van Diemen's Land um, after this, but his wife died in 1837 and he returned to Scotland with his young children, leaving his Australian properties to be managed by various members of the Russell family. So alongside Patrick Wood, the original 1836 Clyde Company partners are listed on this slide. I'm going to talk to each of them very briefly. So first and most briefly, Philip Russell was the older half-brother of the company's manager, George. Patrick Wood had employed Philip Russell in Scotland back in 1821, so he came to Van Diemen's Land to manage Wood's property before becoming a successful pastoralist there in his own right. And Philip Russell supported the subsequent emigration of George and several of his other brothers. The next person there, William Wood, was Patrick Wood's nephew. Um, and this is where I divert myself into the Deniston connection. Two of Patrick Wood's brothers married two Deniston sisters. And those sisters were father, was one of uh, Scotland's richest merchants, James Deniston of Gulf Hill. Now with his brother, James Deniston had founded the Glasgow Mercantile House, J and A Deniston, late in the 18th century. Originally, they traded particularly in American cotton, um, although they also started to trade to the West Indies. Over time, J&A Deniston established um, subsidiaries in Liverpool, London, New Orleans, New York, Normandy in France, and also later Melbourne. When James died in 1835, his estate was valued at more than £200,000, and it included a mortgage for nearly £10,000 over a Demerara plantation. So it's one of James's daughters, Elizabeth, who marries John Wood, the older brother of Patrick, and their eldest son was William Wood, who, as I mentioned, is an original partner in the Clyde Company. While still in his 20s, so sometime before that image was taken, William Wood became manager of J&A De Deniston's Liverpool branch. And then in 1844, he relocated to New York and opened a banking house there called Deniston Wood & Co. The next partners were Theodore Walrand um, of Calder Park in Lanarkshire, and he's connected also to Patrick Wood by marriage. Um, Theodore Walrand was a senior partner in the Scottish West Indian mercantile firm Walrand Ellis, and his grandfather had been an important planter in Antigua. So there's a lot of strong West Indian links here. Theodore himself received 800 pounds compensation for enslaved people on two Trinidad estates 
And he also managed much larger compensation claims for members of his extended family. His nephew, John Stuart Wood, is another of the original Clyde Company partners. Um, Wood was also um, Patrick Wood's first cousin, once removed, and he was a descendant of Patrick Wood's St Kitts-based uncle. Finally, we have Frederick Adamson and John Cross Buchanan. Adamson is another Glasgow merchant. Um, he's recorded by the historian of the Clyde Company, P.L. Brown, as Patrick Wood's second cousin. I'm also almost certain that this Frederick Adamson is the same man who was awarded nearly £7,000 for 133 enslaved people on a British uh, a plantation in British Guyana. Like several others involved with the Clyde Company, Adamson was a prominent pro-slavery activist and he campaigned strongly against emancipation by the Glasgow West India Association uh, in the early decades of the 19th century. And finally, we have John Cross Buchanan of Dumbarton, another Glasgow-based West India merchant and the owner of a West Indian plantation. He inherited fortunes made from slavery, both from his father, John Cross, and his mother, Anna Buchanan. John Cross Buchanan owned an estate in Grenada and another in Dumbartonshire. And he also held shares in the West India merchants, John Cross & Co, which had been started by his father. John Cross Buchanan also received compensation under the um, Emancipation Act. He received nearly 4,000 pounds for people enslaved on his estate in Grenada. So from that, Quick run through, you can see that the Clyde Company's original partners were very enmeshed in the Atlantic economy and the business of slavery, as well as being highly interrelated. I'm still investigating the mechanics of that co-partnership and its connection to the different partners' other business ventures. Um, but already, I think the West Indian connection, the connection to the Atlantic is very clear. And I think that these potted biographies of the partners give us a few clues as to why they chose to invest in the Port Phillip district. First of all, as Patrick Wood, frustrated by diminishing returns in Van Diemen's land, but able to convey knowledge of presumed new opportunities, uh, pastoral opportunities, to his personal connections in Scotland. Second, those Scots investors would later refer to their liquidity in 1836. Some of the cash they had was probably linked to compensation paid out under the Emancipation Act. Third, most of them were experienced merchant capitalists, who traded to the West Indies and the United States. They knew how to manage co-partnerships, how to mitigate the risks of investing capital at a great distance from home, and how to manage um, receiving only delayed returns. Moreover, while the amounts that they invested were very significant in terms of the Port Phillip District's early economy, they weren't large, although they weren't negligible either for these Scottish investors. And finally, I'd point to their unarticulated assumption that even a barely acknowledged British colonial settlement was an appropriate location for Scots to employ their capital. Imperial capital, I think we might say, had a roving eye. I'm going to finish up very briefly by talking about the firm J&A Deniston. Over time, several of those original Clyde Company partners died or they sold out. And the ultimate effect of this was that partners in the Glasgow mercantile firm that I spoke about before, J&A Deniston, acquired a majority share of the Clyde Company. And I just want to briefly turn to the firm's role in the Clyde Company, both as shareholder and agent. I'm still grappling with a lot of this part of the story and some time in Scotland's archives next year will hopefully help. But my initial findings suggest that J&A Deniston's interest in Victorian pastoralism began with, but also extended beyond the Clyde Company. Remember that James Deniston had founded J&A Deniston with his brother. When James died in 1835, control of the firm passed to two of his sons, Alexander and John. The younger John purchased a share in the Clyde Company as early as 1841, but it was his older brother, Alexander, the managing partner now in J&A Deniston, who ultimately acquired the largest share of the Clyde Company. Alexander had married the daughter of a planter, and before taking um, the lead in J&A Deniston in Glasgow, he'd worked for the family firm in New Orleans, in Liverpool, and in Le Havre. He was briefly an MP, and importantly, he was a director of the Union Bank of Scotland. Now, the Deniston brothers employed their nephew-in-law, William Cross, as manager of J&A Deniston in Glasgow, and he too acquired a stake in the Clyde Company. Cross was William Wood's brother-in-law and also a younger brother of John Cross Buchanan, so connected to those original partners. 
And in this way, partners and senior figures in JNA Deniston became majority partners in the Clyde Company. But JNA Deniston, I just want to finish with this point, they'd always been integral to the Clyde Company's operations. It had managed the company's affairs in Britain since 1836, but it also exercised a strong influence in Australia through two agents um, in succession. First, Bells and Buchanan, um, the Clyde Company's Melbourne agents. Um, its founding partners had all gone to Australia, sponsored by J&A Deniston, and William Cross wrote to George Russell explicitly recommending the partners as bred to business, active, enterprising, and prudent. Then in 1852, J&A Deniston decided to establish their own subsidiary, direct subsidiary in Melbourne, Deniston Brothers, and the Clyde Company immediately shifted its business to Deniston Brothers as its agents. To manage their new Antipodean branch, the Denisons again sent out um, new managers, Robert Seller and James McCulloch, who you see there from Glasgow. Robert Seller's brother, William, was married to one of Alexander Denison's daughters. So again, we see these family connections to the fore. Now, these, this closer Australian involvement between j and Deniston and the Clyde Company is one of the factors that actually leads to the dissolution of the company over mid 1850s. Tensions very quickly emerged between George Russell and the new Deniston men in Melbourne. And those tensions reveal, I think, another story of the growing maturity of Victoria's pastoral economy and Russell's status. It clashed particularly with the younger Denistons who arrived in Melbourne in the 1850s. So the winding up of the company leads, um, leaves George Russell as a very wealthy squatter, but it didn't represent the end of Deniston investment in Victoria's pastoral economy. They reinvested um, their money that they liquidated through the Clyde Company in three large pastoral runs near Benella, and these are transferred into their names in the 1870s. So there's a lot still to trace about this, um, but this is one of the firms, one of several British Atlantic mercantile firms who expand to booming 1850s Melbourne. How frequently that mercantile presence is accompanied by pastoral holdings, I'm not sure. But I think in terms of Victoria, the Clyde Company and J&A Deniston remind us that all the capital brought to the colony had a history of its own. And if we can trace that and disentangle the assumptions about empire, land and labour that it encapsulates, the features of settler colonialism or new features of settler colonialism might well emerge. Thanks, Jane. Sorry, that was a bit long. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll move straight on to our next paper, uh, which will be uh, given by Jeremy Martins. Um, so Zoe's going to stop sharing her screen. Have I done that? Uh, no, I can still yeah. see your PowerPoint. So just stop, stop sharing, I think is the button. Great, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, I have questions about Buchanan's, but anyway, moving on to Jeremy. Um, so I'm really delighted to introduce my colleague, Jeremy Martins, also here at the University of Western Australia. Jeremy teaches history um, uh, in, in our department uh, and studied at the universities of Natal in South Africa, uh, Queen's University in Ki uh, Kingston in Canada. He teaches global history, South African, African and British imperial history and the history of race and racism. His research interests include the evolution of immigration restriction legislation in Australia, New Zealand and South Africa, as well as race, gender and the law in 19th and 20th century South Africa. Uh, and as I mentioned before, he's working on our uh, Western Australian Legacies of British Slavery project. I might just mention his most recent book, uh, Empire and Asian Migration, Sovereignty, Immigration Restriction and Protest in the British Settler Colonies. 1888 to 1907, published in 2018 by UWA Publishing. So I will stop there and hand over to Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, can everyone hear me? I, I, and I hope that my screen uh, is being shared and that you can see my PowerPoint. Yep. Um, all good. All good? All right, brilliant. Uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, the land of the Wajok Noongar people, and I'd like to uh, pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so today I'm mostly going to be talking about a part of Western Australia that is uh, east of Perth, um, about 60 miles or so, uh, 100 k's or so. So 
this little map gives you an idea of, of the area that I'm mostly talking about, centered around York, although I do mention other places around there. And this uh, is the land, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Baladong uh, Noongar people. And to give you an idea of just how striking this landscape is, here are a couple of tourist pictures from the Avon Valley, um, which is centered uh, 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 along the Avon Valley around York. All right, so in this paper, I argue that powerful Western Australian colonists successfully co-opted John Hutt, the governor, during the first years of his governorship, by uh, both um, challenging his authority and convincing him to support their interests during a period of escalating conflict between settlers and Noongar communities in the Avon Valley, Swan Valley, and Canning River districts in 1839 and 1840. By 1841, this process of co-optation had facilitated the establishment of the pastoral interest in Western Australia. And here I borrow from Keith McClellan's work on the transformation of the West Indian interest after abolition to define Western Australia's pastoral interest as those elite colonists who were deeply invested in the emerging pastoral industry centered on the Avon Valley, but already expanding its territorial extent and who were connected to the institutions and practices of political power. These men were often in government, for example, as members of the executive and legislative councils or held judicial appointments, such as district magistracies. They were also connected through common interests in land, banking and, and economic interests, especially as they related to pastoralism. Generally speaking, the pastoral interest wished to enlarge the pastoral industry by freeing up cheap land, increasing sheep numbers and facilitating the recruitment of cheap labor. By the time John Hutt assumed the government, governorship of Western Australia in 1839, wool exports were becoming a crucial source of revenue for the country colony, and pastoralists were eager to expand their activities. When Hutt arrived in Western Australia in January of 1839, he was already an unpopular figure. His predecessor, James Sterling, had cemented his reputation as a colonist's governor. He was a colonist himself who owned land and shared the economic interests and outlook of the settler elite. Hutt, in contrast, came to WA as a professional governor, selected by the colonial office to advance it, its interests and priorities, not those of the colonists. Although it was his first vice-regal post, Hutt had imperial administrative experience in India as a court registrar. He was not a colonist. And this distinction between Sterling, the colonist, and Hutt, the colonial administrator, partly explains the muted welcome Hutt received on his arrival in WA in January of 1839. But Settler's suspicion of him ran much deeper than that. As Anne Hunter and others have noted, Hutt was already well known for sympathizing with Edward Gibbon Wakefield's theories of systematic colonization. Hutt's brother, William Hutt, MP for Hull, was closely associated with Wakefield, served on the 1836 Parliamentary Select Committee on the Disposal of Colonial Lands, and was deeply involved in the proposals for the establishment of South Australia. After serving in India, um, Hutt also became involved in the systematic colonization movement and was appointed superintendent of immigration for the South Australian Colonization Commission. Along with his brother, he applied unsuccessfully for the governorship of South Australia, but was offered Western Australia instead. At this point, it is worth briefly reviewing how Sterling responded to Wakefieldian, Wakefieldian instructions from, from the colonial office during his governorship in the 1830s. As early as 1830, colonial office officials had become convinced by Wakefield's criticisms of the Swan River settlement and came to believe that economic revival could only be accomplished by insisting on concentrated settlement and by forcing as much of the land given away in 1829 and 1830, either into cultivation or back to the government. Sterling attempted to push colonists' interests in relation to regulation and control of Crown land, but repeatedly failed to change the minds of colonial office officials. The UK government in, 80, in the 1830s hoped that Australia would absorb surplus unemployed but I believed this absorption could only succeed if land regulations in all colonies were manipulated in a way that promoted a sharp increase in agricultural production. And Wakefield, as we know, theorized that if land in colonies was sold at a price that would exclude labor purchase, 
self-regulating and concentrated agricultural settlement would result, and land revenues could then pay for further immigration. The large land gra grants issued by Sterling in Swan River were seen as an evil that needed to be corrected. Even though many colonists had been attracted to Swan River precisely because of these generous uh, land grants. Furthermore, Wakefieldian policies took little note of the unique agricultural conditions prevailing in Western Australia, and thus entrenched the division between the colonial office and settlers on the ground. Of particular importance were the Ripon regulations of April 1831, which proposed to raise the price of crown land and to, and to repossess unimproved land. Subsequent increases in the price of crown land were so high that agricultural expansion was dampened. Government sales uh, ceased except largely for urban land sites. In adjudicating the division between the colonial office and settlers, Sterling had advanced the interests of WA's colonists as much as possible. While in London in 1832, he had been ordered to enforce the regulations but when he returned to WA, he quickly abandoned any attempts to enforce fines or resume lands. By 1836, Sterling had come out and strongly on the side of the settlers, and in December of 1837, mounted a violent attack on all the inadequacies he perceived in the current policies, especially emphasizing the weaknesses of their Wakefieldian-inspired assumptions, as Cameron points out. However, such criticisms had little effect, and when Sterling's governorship came to an end at the end of 1838, the land issue, and more particularly the disagreement between the colonial office and colonists, remained unresolved. It was in this context that John Hutt arrived with specific instructions to enforce the colonial office directives on land. Less than two weeks after assuming the governorship, Hutt announced that fines for unimproved land would have to be paid by the end of March 1839, and then in the case of non-payment, the surrender value of land would be reduced to one shilling an acre. All unimproved land would be resumed at the end of 1839. The respond of land-holding colonists was overwhelmingly hostile. At an agricultural society meeting, James McDermott criticized Hutt's decrees, um, which, he said, affect our interests very deeply and I fear are only the first of a series of similar notices having for their object to deprive us of those lands we have so dearly purchased in order that we may become the subjects on whom experimental theories of a new party in England may be proved. I would earnestly urge you at once to stand in the breach between those theorists and our small band of enterprising settlers. We are no parties to this new theory, nor have we founded a colony on paper at a distance of 13,000 miles but a practical, substantial, well-ordered community producing supplies adequate to its wants, each individual following his proper vocation and enjoying all the institutions of a civilized community. It was reported in 1839, just a few days, a couple of weeks after um, Hutt's arrival. While the land question was the main focus of settler hostility, it was not the only issue that rankled, however. As I have written about elsewhere, Throughout the 1830s, Sterling had turned a blind eye to settler atrocities directed against known communities and had in fact encouraged extrajudicial violence, especially in the Avon Valley in the late 1830s. This attitude had endeared him to colonists who had little interest in the conventions of British law and due process and who wished to crush indigenous resistance with as little oversight as possible. Hutt was a jurist and status, stated his intention to uphold the law as it related to violence between colonists and Noongar people. He had been given specific instructions to protect WA's indigenous population, quote, in their persons and in the free enjoyment of their possessions, and by all lawful means prevent and restrain all violence and injustice, which may in any manner be practiced or attempted against them. Several months before Hutt assumed the governorship, former Western Australian missionary, Louis Giustiniani had written letters uh, to Lord Glenelg at the colonial office detailing atrocities against Aboriginal people and naming the settlers who had committed them. Glenelg had in turn forwarded these letters to Hutt and directed him to institute an inquiry into the allegations. The response to Hutt's inquiry is illuminating. Hutt wrote letters to George Fletcher Moore, Advocate General of the Colony, and Revit Henry Bland, the resident magistrate for the York District shortly after his arrival in the colony, asking them to inquire into Giustiniani's allegations. 
and to collect evidence and write a report for him. Both men dis dismissed or dis downplayed the violence, characterizing it either as accidental or in self-defense. There were other instances too. In early 1839, the magistrate at 2J, which is north of York, reported that a Noongar man had been viciously flogged by two settlers. And although Hutt directed the magistrate to bring charges against the men, nothing more was done. Hutt's attempts to prosecute settlers for violence against Aboriginal people was deliberately frustrated by colonists, including those in positions of legal authority like Bland. At this juncture, it's important to identify some of the individuals who made up the executive and legislative councils in Western Australia, and to emphasize that Hutt was largely dependent on their advice. Like many colonial governors, he was an outsider who was required to draw on local expertise to govern effectively. And I don't have uh, uh, portraits of, of many of those who are, were in the uh, executive and legislative councils. So I've just picked three here. The Executive Council in 1839 consisted of Hutt himself, along with the military commander Frederick Irwin, the Colonial Secretary Peter Brown, the Advocate General George Fletcher Moore, and the Colonial Surveyor John Septimus Rowe. Most of these men had extensive property interests. Moore, for example, was one of the largest flock holders in Western Australia. And at least two men in the Executive Council, Irwin and Rowe, had participated in punitive expeditions against Noongar people. In 1839, Hutt had been instructed to enlarge the Legislative Council, which consisted of these same men, plus four men nominated by outgoing Governor James Sterling, William Brockman, George Leake, Thomas Peel, and William Tanner, all owned large tracts of land. Uh, Brockman and Tanner had significant pastoral interests. The colonial officers' land regulations and Hutt's resolve to enforce them threatened these interests. Hutt was also dependent on district magistrates who also had significant pastoral and farming interests. Of particular importance in 1839 was that same York resident magistrate, Revit Henry Bland, who was one of the pioneers of sheep rearing in the Avon Valley and one of the most prosperous uh, pastoralists. In addition to keep, insisting to keep the peace, magistrates were also responsible for reporting on whether land grants in their districts had been improved. And it was in this rising uh, context of rising hostility uh, between Hutt and the settler elite that Sarah Cook and her baby were murdered in May 1839 at their house near Beverly in the Avon Valley. Sarah's husband, Elijah Cook, had been away from home shepherding when the murders occurred and discovered his wife and daughter dead and their house burned down. When Bland inspected the scene, he discovered a, a spear left behind, which was identified by Noongar informants as belonging to Hijan, a man whose son had been arrested by Bland and sent to Fremantle jail for sheep stealing. It was also reported that Hijan had threatened to kill settlers as revenge for his son's imprisonment. A theory that seemed to be confirmed some days later when it was reported that Hijan's son had been heard to say that his father intended to kill two settlers for each Noongar person sent to jail. But Hijan was not the only suspect and soon a list of seven Noongar men suspected of the murders had been circulated. Their names had been given to authorities by a Baladong man also in Fremantle Jane jail, sorry, named Dargan, who had been arrested on suspicion of being involved in the murders. It's important to recognize that there were no settler witnesses to the murders, and so Bland and other officials were entirely dependent on the evidence of Noongar informants, even though in 1839 so-called native evidence was not admissible in court. Furthermore, looking at the suspect list, it appears magistrates took the opportunity to target people already suspected of other crimes. Among the seven names were those of Barabong and Dujib, who had been suspected of spearing two settlers, Morphy and Twine, several years before. Morphy later died of his injuries. In the immediate aftermath of the Cook murders, colonists and soldiers immediately embarked on punitive expeditions. While reports of some of these expeditions were provided to Hutt, there is reason to believe that several were not, as there were mentions of raids and private diaries that do not appear in official reports. Most of these raids took, at, took place at night and involved attacking Noongar encampments under cover of darkness. The Cook murders and the raids that followed presented an immediate challenge to Hutt's authority, especially as he was committed to upholding proper legal judicial procedures and due process. However, he also recognized that he would lose face with settlers if he did not uh, act forcefully. <clears throat> 
His initial response was to authorize the shooting of suspected murderers or those suspected of treason resisting or fleeing arrest by drawing on an obscure English common law precedent from the 18th century. However, he quickly realized that extrajudicial murders and other violent acts were being committed by settlers that could not be justified in any legal sense. Hutt repeatedly asked Bland and Fletcher Moore to explain why and in what circumstances Noongar people had been shot. Some, including women and ch children, had been badly wounded. Others had been killed, although in official reports, the number of those killed were always small. And this uh, ties into something that Zoe just talked about as well. The underreporting, I think, of violence was endemic. The replies were often vague. For example, in one letter, Bland claimed a Noongar man had been killed in self-defense, but then immediately went on to state that in relation to Hutt's order that we are not justified in shedding blood, except when the person pursued is known to be a criminal offender, I beg to say it's impossible to tell you who are in you are in pursuit of until close upon them. And then if the na native has his spears, we must be either killed, we must either kill or be killed. Bland went on to say, Quote, his excellency cannot be surprised at a feeling of indignation being roused towards such ungrateful and perfidious neighbors. I am aware that great allowance should be made for savages in the state these are in, who of course cannot sufficiently understand that they are amenable to British law. And the only law they acknowledge is that authority which the stronger party exercise over the weaker. And so long as the government exercise no control over them or endeavor to bring them under some restraint, so long I fear, will these depredations and occasional murders be committed, which give settlers so great a dread and dislike for them that instead of giving them employment, they drive them from their houses wherever they approach them. In early July, some six weeks after the murders, the colonial secretary sent a strongly worded letter to Bland, informing him that Governor Hutt had been informed, quote, by credible persons and at different interviews that a greater number of natives have been shot in the York district during the recent disturbances than you have enumerated in any of your communications. His Excellency wishes you to inquire and endeavor to ascertain if any foundation for such reports exists. So Hutt had clearly heard of these atrocities and that Bland was underreporting them. Bland immediately denied the accusation and responded instead by insisting that, quote, in the present state of affairs, the system of English law was totally insufficient to restore order and protect the lives of settlers. Under these circumstances, I beg to say that if some more decisive me measures than the English law strictly warrants are not at once adopted, I have great reason to fear that the lives of some other settlers will fall a sacrifice to the natives in their re revenge for the slight punishment they have received in our attempting to enforce the law against the perpetrators of the late murders. And here we see Hutt immediately backing down and the quote, uh, that's up on the screen is, is his response to Bland. He said, after a most anxious consideration of the subject, which you have thus brought to notice, this is a letter being written by the colonial secretary, that's why it's in the third person, that he perfectly concurs with you in his opinion. The acts and threats of the natives evince such a system of hostility as would amount among more civilized people to a declaration of war, it becomes therefore necessary to take the requisite steps to secure the lives and properties of the settlers from the danger with, which threatens them. You will accordingly consider yourself authorized to proceed against the individuals either actually charged with or who may have attempted the commission of murder in the way you may consider most certain to bring the offenders to justice. And however reluctant the governor may be to countenance any attacks being made upon them, still if the law may be enforced in no other me measure, you will, if you can, pursue the offenders to their haunts and proceed to extremities rather than allow them to escape with impunity. This amounted to a capitulation to settler demands to punish Nunga communities without legal restraint. Another murder of a settler, this time on the Canning River, ensured that Hutt effectively withdrew his earlier demands that indigenous people should be treated equally under the law. Fletcher Moore remarked derisively that Hutt had finally seen the quote, Necess necessity for action, not theory. His blood seems to be up and he has now endeavored to raise and equip five, dis five distinct parties to pursue the perpetrators. These parties did not capture the murderers, but they did result in the death or injury of several Noongar people during the raids that took place. Hutt was also pressured into establishing a mounted police force, which would provide security for settlers. When Hutt announced the formation of this force in the Legislative Council, he confessed that, quote, I, for one, until I came here, was of opinion that strict justice was not administered to the savage in Western Australia, but I now found it is not easy to treat with him and there is great difficulty in carrying out the law. When the newly established police force captured Barabong and Duji in 1840, 
they were immediately charged with the Cook murders, even though He Jan, who had been named by Bland and others as the prime suspect, uh, had never been caught. And in fact, once Barabong and Dujip had been captured, Bland immediately announced that he no longer believed He Jan was responsible and simply withdrew the warrant for He Jan's arrest. When Dujip and Barabong stood trial shortly afterwards, they were prevented from giving evidence and were convicted on the evidence of the government interpreter who claimed the two men had confessed. Just days after their sentence of death had been passed, Hutt authorized their execution and Barabong and Dujip were hanged at the scene of the Cook murders, the very first judicial executions in Western Australia. Their bodies were left hanging in chains and shortly after the execution, a group of settlers mutilated their bodies with impunity. They were never punished. By mid-1840, it is clear that in, in regard to conflict between settlers and Noongar communities, Hutt had abandoned the high-minded legal principles he had arrived with. He was on, si on the side of the colonists, Bland, Moore, and the others who were eager to eliminate Indigenous resistance, especially in the pastoral districts. Hutt also soon realized that his power to enforce land regulations effectively was very limited. He tried to water down colonial office instructions to appease settlers, who in any case often ignored them. Squatting and the grazing of sheep on crown land increased, and in order to subvert Hutt's attempts to relinquish distant holdings, pastoralists set up temporary outstations so as to satisfy residency requirements. This was the very opposite of concentrated settlement, for it encouraged pastoral expansion, and the pastoral interest had asserted itself. Thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so uh, we now have <clears throat> um, we now have uh, a little bit of time for questions. Uh, I know there are already a couple in the chat. First of all, um, Bob Webb for Zoe, please. Could you dig a little deeper into the colonisation debates you hope to inform by this in interesting corporate and family interest approach? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I think, well, I think the kind of thrust of the whole um, broader project that Jane and Jeremy and I are engaged on has been to um, demonstrate that slavery and its legacies weren't lim limited to the West Indies and to Britain, but form kind of part of a bigger transition within the empire, Britain's empire overall, um, including the settler colonies in um, Australia and indeed New Zealand. Um, and we found all sorts of connections, connections, people who moved between the Caribbean and Brit to Britain and as the Australian colonies, um, ideas as we've been discussing really over the last couple of days and and also there's capital <clears throat> that moves and I think in some ways we started with the money but it's proved one of the most difficult things to trace um, what the um, pastoral companies in the Port Phillip district uh, and also perhaps some of those merchant houses allow us to do is because there are quite good records remaining um, and that the people involved are quite well known we can kind of attempt to flesh out some of the, um, the dimensions of, of the uh, wealth that was transferred from, what was derived in the Atlantic economy and from um, profits from slavery or the business of slavery, if you like, and made its way uh, quite directly uh, to the Australian colonies. So I think bringing that together is really what this is about. Um, mm. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, I'll, I'll come back to you with my Buchanan question a bit later as well. Um, so another question for you, Zoe. Uh, before the Scotsmen left Scotland, were they part of the influential clan families or what was their tie into wealth originally? Uh, obviously, the wealth stayed in the family after that. Were these families also tied into the aristocracy or sons of the aristocracy? And were they tied to the clearances in any way? earlier in the family? Uh, quite a lot there. I'll, um, firstly, about the aristocracy. No, mostly we're not talking about aristocrats here. Um, I might have confused things by referring to Stephen Mullen's book that's just come out called The Glasgow Sugar Aristocracy, but he's not meaning aristocrats in the sense of um, ennobled people by that. He's just meaning um, he's pointing to the development of a class of very wealthy merchants. So these are people who make their money from merchant trade across the Atlantic um, 
And um, the, the phrase that tobacco lords was also used, wasn't it? For the yeah, sorry, God, it's littered with um with, with references uh, to the aristocracy. The tobacco lords had made their money by trading in tobacco from North America, particularly in the 17th and 18th century. Then the sugar aristocracy takes over and it's just a new generation, if you like, a new set of families in some cases um, who are making money out of the trade in sugar from the Caribbean, uh, particularly. Um, so they're not actually the aristocrats, the, the, the big clans and things of Scotland for the most part, but they are becoming very, very wealthy, uh, non-ennobled Scots. Um, I think there was a question there about the clearances. Were they tied to the clearances in any way? And uh, uh, no. Because we're not talking about nobles, not so much, but there are certainly people in this story, including some of the sellers, I think, who I spoke about very briefly at the end, who were the eight, who did act, who enacted clearances, if you like. They were the agents for various lords um, and were involved in that way. But you've probably been a little bit misled by my use of metaphor or my um, repetition of metaphor, sorry. Well, um, but so I'm going to jump in there because um, my, I was very much, um, my attention was caught by the Buchanan family, which of course um, have remained controversial into the present. And I understand that there's a campaign at the moment to remove their name from uh, some of the main, like the main street in Glasgow. Uh, but also I understand that the Buchanans are connected to the Sterling family, if you go back far enough in the tobacco industry. So I'm wondering whether you've come across that or that, you know, that might be a, a link for future. future. Um, yeah, thanks, Jane. The, I mean, there's also the Bells and Buchanan, that Melbourne firm as well, it's Isaac Buchanan. Um, and Isaac's proving harder to kind of pin down. Anna Buchanan is probably one of the most aristocratic people mentioned in that paper. Um, you know, she's an heiress and that family, um, I can't pronounce, the Dumbartonshire estate. It was destroyed in the Second World War, the Ochtinkland Shore, something like that. Um, and that had been in her family for several hundred years. And if you go back, the lords of the manor and stuff were connected to the Stirlings. But um, I think as, as Georgie Arnott's work on the Stirling family showed when we were um, thinking about that in the last couple of years, the complexity and levels of intermarriage in these families and their reuse at every generation and multiple times in generation the same names makes it really really challenging to unpick so um yeah there's lots of them around but I can't say very much more and renewed respect for the family historians as a oh absolutely uh, yeah um I'm going to move on now there are a couple of sort of comments um that really referred to Jeremy's paper Janet Osborne has pointed out that Bland was also briefly the protector of Aborigines for the York district at about the same time that he was deflecting Hutt's inquiries um so and she says ironically or not and I think that's a that's a good point there um Mary Blight has noted that Trimmer became a sub protector of um of Aborigines, also very much involved in violence. Uh, and uh, just scrolling down, sorry, in Al Trimmer, subprotector in Albany, not York. Uh, another question for Zoe. Do you know to what extent the pastoral properties that your subjects owned used Aboriginal labour and whether they paid them at all? <clears throat> Um, I do know something about this. They didn't keep particularly, well, they kept, sorry, this is bedtime in my house. So there's a lot of noise off stage. Um, records about Aboriginal employment are better kept than records of violence against Aboriginal people by these, um, by these pastoralists. And we'd know that they did employ Aboriginal labour. I wouldn't say that um, Aboriginal labour was central to their labour force, although it became really important at various moments, and particularly in the early 1850s when um, the settler labour force basically decamps to the gold fields sort of en masse. Um, certainly for the Clyde Company, we've got correspondence between George Russell and um, AC Cameron, who managed one of the other Clyde Company stations where um, Cameron gets really riled up at one point about another pastoralist who he says, um, excuse the language, but has stolen my blacks um, and because he needed Aboriginal labour uh, for shearing, particularly right. at that moment. 
So there's quite a lot of references to the use of Aboriginal labour and there's quite a bit of obfuscation about how well or whether that um, Aboriginal labour was paid. The work of um, historians like Ian Clark suggests that when Aboriginal workers in Victoria in the sort of 1850s, 60s, 70s were paid, they tended to be paid at less than half the rate of um, their settler counterparts and often were not paid in cash but were paid in kind. Wow. So it, it's a really fragmented story, but certainly there is evidence about that. Um, and Aboriginal labour is commonly used in the 1850s and 60s in Victoria. Great, thank you. Uh, so for Jeremy, uh, Rose Lang asks, do you know of a connection between John Hutt and William Hutt, who was a member of the New Zealand Company and has land named after him in the Wellington region? Well, John Hutt and William Hutt are brothers, and I'm assuming that the William Hutt who is, um, uh, has a New Zealand connection is the same William Hutt there, I think. Um, I imagine. Uh, I don't know, actually, maybe somebody else. Zoe, Jane, do you know? I, I know William Hutt, brother. MP for Hull. Um, they, yeah. they were brothers. They were yeah, brothers. brothers. Um, so, yeah, very good, um, very good link there that, um, that connects these, these metropolitan developments to, uh, to, to their, their practical application. Um, and Gillian Allen says, could I add that sons and grandsons of former West Indian slave owners benefited from public school and university education in science and medicine, for example, and brought their expertise uh, to early Australia. So I think that's, um, that's absolutely right. Sorry, it um, doesn't immediately connect to that the point there, Jeremy. So if, Jeremy, if you had more to add about that. Um, well, I'm actually, I was just going to touch on what uh, Zoe was talking about, because clearly in um, the Avon Valley, uh, uh, Indigenous labour is very important. It's not uh, the only form of labour, but especially in the 1840s, um, widely used, and uh, it's all uh, paid in kind. And there's a question here, what types of things were used to pay in the West Australian context? It was food. So uh, flour, uh, bread, um, those kinds of things. Um, and very, very few. I mean, Fletcher Moore notes in his diary at one point how for the very first time he is paying an, an Aboriginal worker in cash, but that was because, uh, in his view, this person, I think he was a young kid when he um, uh, first met him, had been trained up, quote unquote, and had been educated in such a way that allowed for him to be paid in cash rather than in kind. But otherwise, it's very rare to see in those early years, at any rate, um, any kind of cash payment for, for labour. Thank you very much. I think, I think it's the same in um, Victoria as well, although I suspect there were also sometimes clothing um, and kind of household implements. Certainly when the Aborigines Protection Board starts distributing goods, um, through kind of honorary guardians at various pastoral properties. They include, you know, it's flour, it's sugar, it's tea, um, and it's, it's basic clothing. Uh, those are the main things. And I think that's also true of um, how Aboriginal workers were paid. Yep. Thank you very much. I think we're out of time, uh, but um, I, we'll now move on to the final segment of our program. If I could ask the other panellists to unmute themselves and turn on their cameras. Uh, and of course, thank you very much to Zoe and Jeremy for two fantastic papers. Um, and just as a general comment, I think we've seen a really wonderful complementary array of different approaches um, over the last uh, two days, ranging from you know, the genealogy of ideas that Lorenzo presented this morning through to the very messy um, and, and, um, and, and fraught application of those ideas on the ground, as we've heard from um, most recently Tony. Um, but um, as, as the chair for, the, for this final kind of very short 15, uh, sorry, half hour period that we have left, um, we very much welcome any questions or issues that um, that attendees would like to raise if you want to put that into the chat function. Uh, but I'm just going to start with a couple of questions that, um, that I think have arisen out of the papers we've, we've heard over the last two days. Uh, and that's really 
first of all, what are the explicit and specific and concrete links between the, the system of slavery that Britain abolished in 1833 and the subsequent process of, of colonisation, you know, the, the so-called settler revolution? Um, and just to sort of get the ball, the ball rolling, perhaps, one thing that emerged very strongly for me listening to the papers yesterday and today is, of course, the, um, the, the evocation of, of quite diverse and specific systems of unfree labour that were prevalent in the 1820s and in the 1830s and 1840s. Uh, what, what Claire Anderson, for example, has called a spectrum, you know, these different labour forms. Um, and I think first, first of all, Angela and Rohan, um, Rowan examined these yesterday in their respective case studies, but then that has come up today um, as well, for example, in Tony's paper, and but also um, in your paper, Jeremy. So I just wondered whether anyone had anything <clears throat> to contribute around that, you know, any reflections on that particularly? <coughs> Um, yeah, I'd like to, if I could jump in. Please. I'd like to congratulate you, Jane, and the other conveners on what has been just a fascinating couple of sessions here. I think it's been a really rich and wonderful um, bringing together of scholars and the, their projects. And I think bringing together this fascinating range of settlements um, in the 1830s and 40s, as you were saying, has shown us a lot around uh, practices of labor in particular, but other things. And I guess, you know, just to say a few things here, it seems to me that in contrast to an earlier generation of work on Wakefield and systematic colonization, which focused really tightly on class relations among the British settlers and not much else. And also I think kind of liked to think that systematic colonization really was systematic. I think a lot of the earlier generation of scholars really believed, you know, that this was really systematic and efficient. And I think what these papers, as you've you used the word messy, I think a, what a lot of these papers have had in common is showing just how messy these um, colonies were, how chaotic it was. Um, how often these settlements were barely successful or marginally successful or turned to violence and forced to have any success. And I think um, in relation to the labour question that you raised, um, I think what we can see is that these colonies were so often dependent on force, on violence, on variations of unfree labour that I think, you know, they, they really speak to how we can see you invoked Claire Anderson, but how we can see the range of labour systems, you know, in this period that's supposedly after abolition, and yet we can see this flourishing of this range of unfree variations of unfree labour, under or uncompensated labour, the use of incarceration, uh, forced dislocation. I think we've seen that um, across a really interesting range of examples and uh, bringing these examples of these different colonies together has been really rich that way. Thank you. Yes, and I think violence is key and something that we haven't explicitly brought into discussion until Jeremy's paper, but very much part of that, that process as well. Um, did anyone else have, any, have a, a particular comment there? Um, because if not, I might actually ask Rowan. Um, you, you commented that you're particularly interested in the theme of conceptualising the spaces that link abolition with uh, settler colonialism in Australia. And I guess arising from those quite diverse case studies and ideas um, that we've talked about, <clears throat> uh, do you have any thoughts about, you know, the, the multitude of spaces that were bound into this transition from one system to another? I, I do have thoughts on it. Um, I think Jeremy wanted to jump in as well, so I don't want to interrupt right. if you wanted to go, Jeremy, on the previous. No, no, point. you go. You go ahead, uh, Ryan. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think my 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 point is quite a basic one in that it's a kind of a novel appreciation of the fact of the scale of the spaces that are bounded into this transition. I think it's something that, um, you know, there's obviously been this 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 wave of of scholarship simply on unpacking the transition from this kind of reorientation of empire from west to east and and linking settler colonialism and, and abolition 
And I think it's worth kind of seeing the the sheer range of cases presented over the last couple of days as sort of an impetus for further scholarship in this direction, as saying that it can continually push it into new spatial directions that, um, you know, the Port Phillip district isn't necessarily the first place people uh, are thinking of when looking at unpacking the the, the links to abolition and slavery in, in an Australasian context. Um, and I think kind of Matthew's not here at the moment, but I think his work on kind of pushing it into places like the Van Diemen's Land Company is again um, kind of outlining almost a future direction for, for some of these projects, um, you know, taking up what are the the other kind of spaces that are connected. And I know my my interest is particularly remote in seeing how it kind of goes into the Southern Ocean Islands, but I think there are other spaces uh, that aren't yet accounted for that could be part of it. So I guess I'm seeing it as future directions for this really uh, exciting scholarship. And I think you've raised this question of scale and integrating um, what Matthew Virtual in his um, email comments to me earlier today called micro studies of labour regimes. Um, thinking of Tony's paper on Otago and your work, Rowan, on um, the Auckland Islands and so on and so on. Um, but I think that's also, it, it speaks to the question that we identified yesterday after Jane's keynote about drawing on um, the rich sort of cultural histories around um, this area and incorporating them or bringing it into conversation with um, the, the sort of more, um, uh, the recent political and economic analyses. And I wondered actually, Tony, your work, um, you and Antoinette Burton published um, a book in 2014, Empires in the Reach of the Global, which I think aimed to do exactly that. Could, could you sort of speak perhaps to your method there or your aims? Yeah, it feels like a really long time ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but I, you know, the jumping off point for me is, is uh, you know, these conversations I think have really underscored connections in both space and time. And, and I really wanted to acknowledge Lorenzo's paper and, and the way in which it reminded us of some of what we might think of as deeper genealogies, but maybe family resemblances rather than direct descendants in terms of these, these uh, theories and visions of empire. Um, and, you know, and if you think about the Otago case, although we can think about it as a micro study, it's profoundly connected. I mean, those connections that shape the labor systems are world spanning. Even the indigenous system is world spanning. You know, Kaitahu's adoption of a seasonal um, system of production and organization comes because that ultimately they cannot transplant inherited systems of, of Polynesian agriculture to the climate down here. So it's an, an adaptation. Um, and, and, you know, Tatipani Regan talks about dynamic adaptation being at the heart of Maori and Polynesian history. So, you know, we've got these um, uh, transitions going on um, that uh working out of connections in in space and but also connections in time and again if you think about the scottish settlers here their ideas about improvement are deeply conditioned by scottish history and you know one place you might go to is the highland clearances but another place you could go to um equally is is the improvement of the lowlands and the agricultural revolution in the lowlands of scotland in the early 19th century and of course, that agricultural revolution in the lowlands of Scotland itself was enabled to a significant extent by the wealth generated by East India trade and by investment in the Atlantic economy. So, you know, once you begin pulling on these connections, I think you can see them um, working like webs or fractals. But but I think that connection in time is really significant as well. Mm. And, and the way in which these systems are arguments in many ways against the past as well as working through the freight of the past. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, I've just seen that there is um, a slight side discussion in the chat, which um, I might bring into uh, the, the round table. Um, MF, I don't know your name, MF, but um, you've asked, do you feel that the governing, the, um, the Crown's assumed lands when those governors seem to be in sympathy uh, with Aboriginal people, but were dependent on the other invader colonists? Was this a position of posturing? And if so, what was that used for? How did it help them to control more? 
So, Jeremy, do, do you have a response to that? Yeah, so I, as I, I think I tried to type there, I mean, I think uh, there are some principal governors, people who, like Hutt, I think, in many ways, was uh, really um, committed to what he saw as a kind of human, humanitarian impulse. Um, but of course, these are, in this case, men of their time and place. They share the prejudices of uh, other settlers. And then when they get onto, in, you know, on the spot in, in the colonies, they often, um, you know, react to con contingent contingencies in violent ways. And just going back to that earlier point about violence, I think one of the things that's been interesting about comparing, say, the violence of slave colonies and the violence of, say, Western Australia in the early years of settlement here, uh, or conquest here, um, it's very similar, but you don't necessarily need to see the direct um, crossover, although there are some personalities who come to Western Australia from, say, the Caribbean and presumably have certain uh, experiences when it comes to, to uh, forced labour and, and using violence to enforce uh, discipline, etc., but it, you don't need that background. I mean, there are plenty of ordinary kind of British settlers who um, take to violence very quickly. Um, and so I think some of the connections are, are, are not necessarily just actual people moving from place to place, but just a, a, a continuation, I think, of, of, um, of the uh, necessity, if you like, of disciplining uh, labor, of, of creating a pool of, of, of coerced uh, labor. So punishment um, implies the sort of legitimacy of British law. I'm going to move on now. Jo Rose Lang has said um, she's inspired by Jane Carey and her work on Wakefield settler colonialism and reproduction. So this is a question for all, um, all of us in the round table. Women had been seen as key for the continuation of settler colonialism. Uh, she's now thinking about how slaves had been seen as property were settlers ever seen as property of the British Empire? How does this affect how we think about colonialism? And how does this impact post-colonial identity today? I think that's an excellent question and I think property is really key. Does anyone have an immediate response? Um, um, I, I might just jump in there because I've recently been doing a little bit of work on Wakefield and his abduction of Ellen Turner, which of course landed him in Newgate in the first place. And I think abduction until not that long ago was seen as a slightly, um, it, it was a very familiar motif in British literature, um, but we now recognise that, you know, we now call it theft because the definition of abduction was that you were stealing an heiress. So a woman without property could complain of rape, but she could not Lodge, you know, she could not make an accusation of abduction. So I think Wakefield already um, had form in, in this kind of property theft. And so rather than see his abduction as a sort of um, an early an anomaly, I'd like to see it as very closely connected to the principle of stealing Indigenous land that was central to his colonial policy as well. Um, so, but getting back to this, this sort of particular question, um, Jane, do you have any, any sort of thoughts about this um, and, and whether settlers were seen as property? I mean, I think you showed in your keynote yesterday that women and children could be given a dollar value, uh, which was a, a colonial technique that we saw in Swan River as well. Um, yeah, thanks, Jane. Um, I actually was going to to mention that um, the, the kidnapping, like Field's um, practice of kidnapping women, as a on train to some of this as well. So, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't uh, uh, the term property, no. But yeah, the economic value in terms of putting a dollar and cent kind of value, and that did apply to women as well in some cases. Um, you know, not just Wakefield kind of calculating out their value, but in those um, statistical accounts of the, the enumeration of the colony, the, the burden, the cost of, of supporting them, um, and at times the, the cost of uh, the, the productive labour, the value of their productive labour. So that view of, of uh, these uh, settlers as having a productive value, um, yeah, that certainly um, is, is, is one way in which they're kind of linked to property um, as a form of property through their 
through the land that they are they are making value for. Does that make sense? That it's yeah you know, the improvement of the land is the dollar value that they have, if you if you like. And um, from a, the perspective yeah. of the Swan River, I think when we when we see the land returns and the huge acreage that was given to settlers. Um, that's put alongside what they brought to the colony, including, you know, three shillings for each child over the age of three and so forth, um, which very graphically sort of represents that. Does anybody else have a comment um, on that? You know, the idea of chattels and people as property, I think is really quite underlies. Um, <clears throat> Angela does, I think, but you're on mute, Angela. Thank you for pointing that out, Zoe. <laughs> um, I guess what springs to my mind is thinking about convicts and, you know, do convicts count as settlers and as agents of settler colonialism when, you know, they were transported so they were, in, in a sense, unfree agents or instruments. And yet I think in a way we have to see them as settlers to some degree. And, of course, convict labour did so much to build colonies. So, you know, seeing them as, and, of course, you know, they're, the British government is investing large sums of money in sending them and um, so forth. So perhaps there's a connection there in terms of thinking of settlers as property. Thank you. Jane? Yeah, just to um, just quickly respond again about the ways that um, settlers and convicts are actually categorised in those enumerations. So they're, they're seen as separate categories um, until the convicts are eman emancipated, then they're called settlers from convicts for a time. And then the distinction actually disappears from the way that the, the populations are enumerated. So there's, there's definitely changes in thinking around that. And, you know, Philip's initial feelings were that the, the colony could, should not be founded by convicts. That was, he wanted the free settlers actually to be, he wanted more free settlers to be the founding kind of um, the people of the colony. Um, but just on that, I, I just want to go back to something earlier um, around the way that we're seeing this transition happening in the 1830s around um, labour practices and settler colonialism and, and so on and so forth. And, and back to something Tony also said earlier about needing to look backwards as well. Because this transition, these learnings, these takings um, are happening much earlier, before the 1830s, that, that, that this is already in process, if you like, and that we can see some of those um, influences already in the Sydney colony well before Wakefield in terms of ideas about labour. So, yeah, just to, to see that as a, an acceleration point, if you like, but not necessarily the originary point of all of these kinds of shifting ideas. Yeah. Thank you. And I think that's, that's something that, for me, has come out of many of the papers, that we might see a moment like the 1833 Abolition Act, the Emancipation as a moment within a transition rather than a turning point. And in the same way, Wakefield's codification of these ideas, you know, that this is, again, a moment rather than um, a before and after, you know, it, it's, and, and um, you know, these ideas or principles were more or less applied with, you know, more or less effect. Zoe, did you have a comment there as well? Yeah, no, really to endorse well, both, what both Every Jane has said. Um, which I think, you know, I, I see emancipation as a moment of acceleration of, of supercharging some of these processes. They've clearly been going on um, since, you know, before the American Revolution. Um, and there's, you know, there's kind of moments along there. So we're, we're sort of in a Chris Bailey or a Peter Marshall zone or an era of change rather than, you know, pointing to any particular moment, I think. But I do think that the capital that's released and the angst associated with you know emancipation when it finally arrives people have seen it coming for a long time and then it's there what are they going to do especially those actors I've been looking at recently who are very enmeshed in the Atlantic economy um, you know it sort of it it fuels their desire to look elsewhere I think um, and so I think it's important in that way as a moment but yeah I think it's a it's a much longer period Absolutely, that's right. And um, within the context of other, other shifts as well. Yeah, um, I'm going to just look at the return to the chat for a moment. Um, Judith Mc, McVeigh says, um, does anyone have research on the response by those who labour 
how did their actions change the processes at all, which I think is such an important question um, and which I think perhaps Tony's paper certainly um, is it sort of spoke to a little bit. But um, just very quickly as well, Janet Osborne responds, uh, the truism in Western Australia is that Noongar labourers had too much agency and too little stake in the colonial economy to prostrate themselves in the required manner, leading the, the York agriculturalists to beg for WA to become a carceral colony so they could make use of some genuinely unfree convict labour, which is uh, very true in the Western Australian um, context. But does anybody else in, in the panel have any comments about the responses by those um, who laboured and their impact on this process? I would just suggest that I think that, you know, we started off this session by talking about, you know, um, instead of systematic colonisation, what we're seeing is messy, chaotic, idiosyncratic, malevolent, you know, the, the, the malevolence of the colonisation comes through. And I think that all of those features are brought out when we take the perspective of those who are labouring in particular, those who are disadvantaged directly dispossessed, whose lands expro expropriated and so on. Um, so I think the more we look to that, the more we will find those, those mm. voices. Great, thank you. Jeremy, I see you've, your hand is raised. Yeah. One of the things that, it's not directly about labour, but one of the things I really started thinking about during Rowan's paper yesterday, and with the research that I've been doing lately too, and I'm really a uh, dead of, gratitude to James Cameron's work on early Western Australia is just how environmental conditions could really determine the outcome of Wakefieldian um, systematic colonization. And I think had Western Australia been a more kind of amenable uh, environment for, you know, the kind of uh, close settlement and agricultural production that uh, Wakefield envisaged, um, you know, it is. It's. It. You could imagine a different kind of outcome. Uh, certainly in Australia, uh, for for one thing. Um, so that's one of the things. And I mean, with, with Rowan, uh, you know, talking about yesterday, just the harsh conditions uh, in uh, in the Auckland Islands being a really important part of that story. And I think it's the case also in Western Australia and helps account for why people are so hostile. Thank you, Tony. So just just on this question about the, the ability of laborers and, and and workers to 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 control or influence or shape social formations, in the Otago case, you, you can make a very convincing argument. I think that the the failure of the Otago uh, Association to deliver their vision, which was a homogenous Scottish Presbyterian settlement, actually had really profound long term consequences because what you get is actually a, a, a very mixed community in terms of ethnicity and denomination. Slight Scottish Presbyterian majority, lots of English nonconformists, um, lots of English Anglicans, uh, dense population of Irish, densely concentrated population of Irish Catholics. And the argument that Eric Olson, the very important New Zealand Labour historian has made for a slightly later period is, that what that leads to actually is the emergence of, of um, institutions that bring those communities together. So you, you get the, in a way, those institutions are powerful enough that it means those ethnic identities aren't actually effectively reproduced on the ground. And that really enables the emergence of very strong class identification and the great um, you know, class mobilizations that we see in New Zealand and unionization in the 1880s, but also the strength of first wave feminism. So, you know, his argument really is that the mixed nature of the colonial population and the absence of residential segregation leads to the emergence of progressive politics, which in the long term, in his argument, it really is an outcome of the failure of Wakefield systematic colonization. I mean, it's a very interesting argument to think about the long term consequences of this messiness that we're talking about, that it, it produces these negotiated outcomes of course at the boundaries of those outcomes are terrible exclusions so you know exclusions and the racist uh, legislation targeted against you know chinese mobile chinese populations thinking about william pember reeve saying 
Australia and New Zealand's great experiments, progressive experiments, began with the exclusion of the Chinese. So, you know, there are, you know, terrible exclusions and terrible racism baked in, but also these um, very unpredictable um, social formations that emerge out of the, the demographic failure and the economic failure of that vision of systematic and orderly colonization. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, yeah, it makes me wonder what would Mark say, <clears throat> you know, in his comments, so Lorenzo, <laughs> um, in, in these, the, 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 his sort of take, his very um, satirical take on Wakefield um, and his visions, what would he have to say to that, do you think? Oh, you're, you're on mute, <laughs> throwing your hands up. Um, look, another, another messy situation that develops um, um, in conjunction with um, the deployment of Wakefield's ideas is that um, the gold fields, the alluvial gold fields, are um, are a, are a moment of are another moment of um, capitalism's general crisis because um, people abscond, leave, escape, disgruntled, you know, sailors leave their captains, shepherds leave their stations. They all gather at the gold fields and they have to just squat on a few square meters of land. With, and um, and they reconnect with means of subsistence. So um, the 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 whole thing is a maelstrom that uh, undoes whatever sy systematizing that was was ever proposed by by the colonial um, um, governance institutions. So um, um, we know what Marx said. Marx said, "Look, um, you you can run away, but um, precisely because you run away, you then developed in a way that." Um, you know, makes contradiction catch up. Um, but uh, contradictions prop up everywhere, including in the gold fields. We, we, we think that uh, there are moments of capital accumulation, but in fact, especially the alluvial gold fields, they are a moment of disruption. And um, only later um, when capital requirements for, you know, the you know, proper digging is, is required and the wage relation emerges. But at first, there are a moment in which the wage relation, whatever is there, is completely disrupted. So you have all sorts of uh, um, um, sort of escapes happening all at once, and there is um, there is nothing that systematizes really can do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, look, we're actually exactly um, out of time on that note. I see that Ron has some fantastic comments about disconnection in the chat, but um, we, we will have, hope to, um, to be able to think through this and uh, lots of other ideas that um, have been prompted by the papers over the last two days. So thank you very much to all our panellists. Thank you uh, to the attendees as well. And uh, the recording will be provided on our website in due course. So um, on that note, I'll say goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you Jane. Thanks, Thanks Jane. Jane.